All right, welcome to Stampscape's Friday Night Live. We're going to be doing three cards and uh, kind of focused around sympathy cards. So as card makers, I'm sure we've all kind of done that theme before. Um, for me, I like to make things nice and light and airy and the cloud cumulus is, for me, what those cards, um, I don't know, it, it's the perfect foundation for that type of um, theme or mood or um, that type of spirit for what, what I'm going after. Okay, so let's just get into it. All right, so I'm going to do um, a couple different scenarios here. In one of them, I think I'll use both the large and smaller cloud cumulus, and I'll do them in two different values to represent um, spatial depth in the piece. If something is usually darker of a similar or the same um, form, it usually represents something that's closer to us. So in this case, um, scale and value will be uh, representing that. So in this case, I'll do the cloud cumulus in a little bit of a darker tone, um, medium tone blue, and the, the smaller one, which represents something a little bit farther off in the distance, will be a lighter tone. Okay, so um, I'll go with blue tones. I don't, you know, in this type of spirit, I don't want to go with anything too dark. So we'll go with the medium tone, which is a light blue in Marvy. Um, in Memento, it'll be something like Bahama Blue. Um, I don't know some of the names of some of the other colors and other lines, but... Uh, you know, basically like a royal blue or something like that. And then if you have a lighter blue, like a sky blue, that would be perfect for a lighter um, value for this uh, scenario here. Okay, so this is going to be um, kind of looking up at the sky type of thing scenario here. So I'm going to um, angle my clouds in a way that will have kind of a upper, in this case, left-hand corner as an opening in the sky. So I'll be laying this down here, and this is going to go above it, okay? So what I want to do is in that transition zone between small and large, or just in between um, layers of clouds, even if it was just one size that I was using in here, I want to make more graceful that transition zone so what that really just means is I just wipe off the ink off the area that I'm going to be layering my cloud in okay so if I lay that right here what I've done is I've removed a lot of the ink right here okay and that's where that overlap's going to occur like that hello Patty Debbie Bonnie Candy Good to see you all. Hope you had a nice week. Everyone doing all right? Okay, let's see here. Like that. And you can see right there, that's really the color of that ink that I used um, right here. But you can see if you remove a lot of the ink, it's much drier and therefore it stamps out much lighter and that's where my other stamps are going to go. So nice and light and airy um, for this uh, piece here. I think my blue here is getting a little bit, uh, it's starting to disintegrate here. <laughs> I might switch off to my memento pad here. This is like a 30 year old pad right here. As you can see, I use my uh, media until uh, it basically can't be used anymore. Or if I ever you know, like ran out of uh, re-inker fluid for it or something like that. Okay, so this is going to overlap about right into here. So you can see that's where I've wiped off the perimeter. So it transitions a little bit easier. You don't always have to do that, but it just makes for the transitions to be kind of inherently graceful. Um, and it, it, it it's really um, comes into play wiping off the edges the darker the ink you use because the darker the ink, you know, the potentially the more um, contrast you're creating between 
your impression in the background, okay? So if I was doing this in black, you know, dark night or something like that, stormy night, something like that, ominous, um, then, um, you know, like a, a black perimeter um, area is going to stand out much more than, you know, something, I don't know, 70% lighter, okay? But I just think it's um, just a good um, habit to get into in terms of uh, wiping off the perimeters of uh, your sky figures there. Lucian Hawkins, good to see you. Christine, Shelley, thanks for joining in. <laughs> you don't have to think like me. Just do the same kind of process, you know, and it, it it's all quite easy. I don't think this way. It's just, you know, process. It's just a kind of a, a, um, a technique or something like that. Um, process that I, that, you know, it's a formula. I guess that's, that's the correct term that I've come up with, you know, that I, that I just use, you know, with every uh, thing. And it's always kind of tw getting tweaked, you know, depending on, um, what, uh, what media we're using, you know, um, if you're using like something like papers, like cardstock, this is a glossy cardstock, by the way, that I'm using. Okay. So I've wiped off the bottom of this right here quite a bit as well as the top, okay? Right there. Uh, and here's a perfect example. It's not something I, you know, did. I'm actually a really slow learner. So I just started kind of wiping off the perimeter. I don't know. It was probably, I don't know, 15, 20 years after I started using it. It's like, oh, maybe this will be better. <laughs> And then I just, you know, I just remember that uh, going forward, okay? All right, so wiping off the edge like that. Now, see, I'm going to have this kind of open into open sky up here, too. So it's just better to not have that hard line. Now, that that area is darker up there because if I don't have any of that tone, then there's nothing to define that edge right here because this is not an outline design. So it's like... Well, if we're wiping off the edge, then why did you draw it in there to begin with? It's it's in there. It's just a very light version of those of that texture and tone in there. And you can just you know, the good thing about um, making impressions and stamps is that you know whatever ink you're you, we're using. I mean, we don't have to use multiple values of in this case blue to get multiple values just in our impression all we have to do is remove some of that ink or you can remove a lot of it and then remove some of it like that and then you have three different values of blue in one impression like that so it's like you kind of get like three different values all in one all right there i didn't take off enough <laughs> here i'll show you right here all right, let's take off a little bit more here. Okay, there we go. Don't be too gingerly with it, especially if you're, you know, your pad's really inked up quite a bit, which this one seems to be right now. Okay, let's go like this. If you notice, I'm kind of pointing it, and I talk about this cloud a lot um, with, uh, you know, these different um, lessons that I do. It's a really great filler stamp. Um, and it's one of those that um, I, I have so many lessons using it and just isolated um, lessons using it. Um, and it's just so that people don't stamp it out kind of like, um, I always call it like masonry, like you're stacking it like bricks or like Legos or something like that where the uh, edges are very apparent like that. Okay, now let's make this one really quite light. So let's remove a little bit more. Like that, the lighting is coming from right here, so I have this turned kind of upside down, you know. Uh, there really isn't any right side up or upside down, but just for reference like that. Um, so underneath, the clouds are, the billows are facing towards that light, and clouds above the light, you face them down or like that. So if you've just logged on um, or haven't checked out these videos before where I've mentioned it, but usually people are using unmounted stamps these days where you don't have this um, 
indexing on the top of like a wood mounted stamp. So one of the tips that one of my customers showed me was that um, she has on the back of her piece of rubber just uh, an arrow pointing, you know, in the direction of light. So she always knows where, you know, when she's stamping it out with an acrylic block or a stamp positioner or misty or whatever, um, she knows what direction the lighting is coming from. So if she's using this cloud around a moon or a sun or something like that, she just always has that on the rubber. So when she's stamping it out, it's always pointing towards that light source like that. Okay, so that's, you know, kind of the lighting right in here. You almost, you know, we don't have to do too much um, coloring on here. I'll add some extra tones in here to really emphasize light. But, um, you know, just when we're doing this thing with uh, wiping off the ink like that and getting multiple tonal ranges, this is all one color of ink that I've used on here. Um, you know, you can get that variation just within your impressions. So it really kind of um, remedies the uh, the need for a lot of extra tone. Here, I'll grab um, a couple of these mementos, speaking of memento, to color this with, okay? I'm gonna do um, some of my layouts here first, and then I'll come out, come, uh, add in some of the, uh, some of the imagery um, afterwards, okay? You can work like that. You, you can add in your images. I can stamp out my main images first and then do the clouds behind it. Um, or you can do the clouds first and stamp the imagery right over the top. It just depends on if you're using um, a lot of more kind of silhouette styles of imagery, then it doesn't matter if you do this first or afterwards, you know, background first, imagery last, or imagery first and background because your darker tones are always going to look like they're um, laid over the top of your cloud. You know, with a beginning stamper, someone might think, okay, wait a minute, if you stamp this out first right here, I, I get these questions all the time, or used to. If I stamp this over this in a light blue, is the cloud going to be in front of, you know, the tree? That's, that's what people, uh, you know, that's the type of question that I get asked. Or some people might think, you know, that, you know, will happen. Anyway, <laughs> let's see. Uh, so Shelly, Megan, Megan, Megan Ells, good to see you. Thanks for thanks for making it. <laughs> uh, hello, Julie. Bonnie cleared out the rose bed. Looks like I've been in a cat. <laughs> That's one of those things with gardening, huh? With uh, prickly bushes like that. Do you wear do you wear like uh, gloves, like gardening gloves, Bonnie? Yeah, we have a nice day right now too. It was a little bit chillier here. I don't know what temperature is it for you, uh, Linda. I watch on TV now. <laughs> Someone showed me, um, uh, they sent me a, a photo of um, the uh, Friday Night Live, like really big. I was like, uh, oh, there I am, like uh, on screen, horrific. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, you know, like a big, four, I don't know, 40, 50 inch uh, widescreen. Okay, so anyways. Uh, okay, now this one I'm going to add in this uh, lighthouse in the background, but I still am going to place my, um, my uh, like another source of light right in here. These are kind of, these are sympathy cards. Don't let it, uh, you know, ruin the, the fun of the, uh, the, uh, the live stream here though. But um, I don't know. If you're card makers, we've probably all made them before, right? But I, I needed three of them um, here, so. Nice and light and airy and, you know, that's what I'm, I'm going for in these pieces. And like, okay, on this one right here, I'm going to have basically like one source of light with you know, probably I'll probably add in some light beams into this. On this one right here, this uh, lighthouse, I mean, it, people use it for all kinds of things, but in terms of um, 
setting the tone or mood of a piece. I, I've seen this one used as a like a symphony um, card um, image uh, many times over the years. So it's kind of like two light sources in here. You can have this light coming out like that and another light coming down this way, um, which I kind of like the idea of. This is almost kind of, your quarter page is almost kind of small for that, but um, it'll just be jam-packed full of um, kind of a, a light and airy type of um, scenario here. Okay, so the Bahama blue is a little bit lighter, I think, than the um, the Marvy blue, like that. This Bahama blue right here is almost, I almost feel like it's um, the color of this. It's closer to this in terms of the indexing of this um, pad right here. But I'm going, here, I'm going with a little bit of a lighter color here. Because I don't really want to have to stamp this out and then mask it off and then stamp the clouds behind it. I feel that if I stamp these clouds light enough, this lighthouse right here, the silhouette of it is dark enough to where I can just stamp it right over the top of it and not worry about, you know, some of those clouds showing through the open areas, you know, of the image, okay? So, you know, the more kind of silhouette based and images again, the more kind of, um, universal it is in terms of, uh, or not, maybe not universal, but the more um, flexible it is in terms of um, sequencing, you know, backgrounds first or, you know, foregrounds. That's another question that I get all the time is, do you add in the, do you do the colors in the background first or do you stamp out your imagery first and then color it in? And the answer is, it, it just depends on, um, what you're um, doing and what you're going after. Like if I'm doing like a lot of layered, super thick layered tones in the background, um, thing that comes to mind or something like, you know, an Aurora Borealis or something like that with a lot of layered streaks of color or something like that. A lot of times I don't want to stamp out my imagery first. I just want to do the background, you know, because, um, I don't want to stamp out an image and wait for it to dry a long time, especially if I'm going to be layering, I don't know, whatever, you know, seven layers of ink or something like that in that type of, um, that type of scene. Okay, let's just do this real fast. Okay, so the lighthouse is going in here, so I don't want too heavy of an image. I'll just go for a really light one like that, okay? I don't need this to really blend in too much around in this area. Okay, down here like this. Okay, so it's just like that. So it's real blocky looking. But again, I don't worry about, I'm not worried about that because this is going in here. We're gonna bring in a lot of tone in here to blend it in. And then I'm gonna have these like beams of light coming in, you know, from, you know, a couple of different directions, I think. You don't see like the beams of light already kind of like right in here. So sometimes it's kind of what happens inherently in the impressions, the initial impressions, I just kind of go with, you see, you see that right there? Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just because I didn't stamp a, another cloud right here. It's kind of open right there. So I'm just thinking, okay, that's just what naturally happened right there. But just by chance, I'll just kind of go with that, with that scene. Now this Bahama blue looks pretty good. I, I, I like the uh, the color. This one right here, it looks like that light blue might be the last time that I use this to make impressions with. Do you see those little crumb types of... Uh, and it's like these little crumbs are... Uh, this is starting to disintegrate right here. <laughs> so, anyway. Goodbye to Marvy pads, you know. All right, and this one is going to be a desert scenario. So I wanna have these um, clouds kind of rising from um, the land, and I'm just gonna have a, like a narrow strip of um, earth down here. I'm gonna have this little figure kind of walking off into the distance. Um, so let's do it like this. Let's have the lighting coming kind of more from the horizon, so I'll go with the bottom lit. Um, arrangement of clouds. Okay, so let's, let's go for a little bit of a darker cloud up top. Okay, when I say darker, it's just going to be darker than 
the next layer of clouds that I lay in here. One of, one of the things about that I do with um, cl the cloud stamp too is I'm kind of using center pressuring like this. I don't rock it like this on the edges. If you're using a misty or something like a stamp positioner, um, close, you know, make your impression, but kind of go with a center um, type of pressuring on it. So again, you're not going to get like, you know, real hard edges like that, okay? around up here. Okay, now I, I also didn't wipe this off. I mean, you, you can also wipe it off to completely avoid that, but I'm just saying that, you know, you don't have to do that, especially with lighter tones. Okay, now this is where it's going to start transitioning off into nothing but light, you know, and air, kind of a horizon glow, okay? So let's get rid of this. Um, I'm getting rid of, like, if this is the rubber that I'm doing, I'm kind of wiping, like, all into here. So I'm kind of going about I'm wiping off this entire portion up top and then going about maybe a quarter inch to a half inch, okay? There's not like some kind of like point where it's like uh, wiping off. Oh, you know, I took off too much or something like that. It's not like that. Okay, so you can see where that's really light. So see, that's without kind of wiping off that cloud and that it's wiping it off right there. So see, we get that area right there. If you want it to stamp out even lighter too when you're doing this, um, you can take this like this, you can wipe it off first, and then you, what you do is you use more pressure in this area as opposed to up here, okay? All right, so anyways, that's my little kind of horizon scenario right here. I'll have this earthen right here. I think I'll have some like beams of light coming from like up this way. All right. Let me see, what was that 48 years there? I'm scrolling up here. <laughs> wait, is it someone's anniversary? Wait, 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 wait. someone's anniversary today? After 48 years, Candy. Uh, is that Candy? Or is it Linda there? Wait, thanks for the anniversary coming. Oh, Linda. Oh, that is that Linda's coming soon? Whoever's that was, congrats there. Uh, stamp out a card for that anniversary and then put uh, 48 stars in the sky. <laughs> and then on the inside of the card say um, count, you know, the stars or something like that. They'll say, um, yeah, I only counted like 40, I got up to 40, uh, 40, 70. You can say, well, one of them is really dim. It was that kind of that rocky year for us. <laughs> but nevertheless important. Or do 48, I don't know, do 48 uh, uh, little twinkly rhinestones or something like that. Okay, so we have our lighting in here. I'm Okay, now th this is where... Um, this is what I'm thinking about right here now. I'm thinking about, should I start adding in some tones or something like that now, or do I want to um, add in my imagery so I know where my imagery is going to go and then I'll kind of work around that. But I think I'm just going to do um, my backgrounds first a little bit because I'm not gonna add in, I'm not, I'm not taking these um, scenes like from all the way something light to a really dark area you know, on these, uh, on this particular, you know, card scenario. A lot of times I would, if it was just, I don't know, just for any occasion. Uh, but on these ones, I like it to keep it nice and light and airy. And I like to focus on, oh, I would say maybe a 50% or so. Like this is as dark as it'll get right here. And I like to keep most of the, uh, 
Uh, the theme of the card, I'm guessing, you know, when I look at it, I haven't really analyzed it over the years, but it's probably, you know, the predominantly 30% and below, you know, so a lot of um, white pigment ink in there to make things like soft and airy and light and uplifting um, here. Okay, so let's start off with some Summer Sky. I'm wondering if my Summer Sky is even moist. I, I don't use this one too often. This is practically like a shadow stamping ink. It looks darker on, on this, but when you start applying it, it's really, really light. Okay. All right, this is just a piece of paper towel. It's only like makes it into something like, a, you know, like finger painting. Okay, so what we have here is this light in here. I don't want to just color that out, okay? I want there to be light coming into the scenario here, but see this area of the, uh, the clouds where they're darker like that? So it's going from dark you know, it's basically like this. It's going from darker to lighter, like up here, okay? And then this is going darker right here, and this is transitioning into this next area right here, and it's going from darker to light like that. So it's like dark, light, dark, light like that. Okay, so basically all you have to really think about when you're doing this type of thing is I'm just reinforcing where it's already darker like that. Okay, so I'm making this area a little bit darker like that and leaving the tops of them light like that. So it will look like light is hitting those clouds like that. Okay, so you probably can't tell too much, but this is a really light tone and it doesn't develop, it's not like suddenly, oh my god, look, look at all that shading in there. You know, it's just laying down like a really light, here, let me try to get a good slathering of it. See, like that, like at its darkest point, it's that dark right there. So when I just go like this, you know, it's a really light application of that color right there. So if you haven't done this before, um, this type of coloring, and this is on glossy cardstock, you can do it on semi-gloss or matte. Matte starts to absorb your ink faster, so your transferring of your ink is faster because it's absorbing that much faster. But if you start off with a really light tone like this, a lot of times people will go on here and it's like, I can't see anything happening at all, okay? So they move up into the darker tone and then they go like that, and it's like, it might be creating like a much stronger contrast and there's less control over it that way. I'm talking about if you just haven't done this type of toning before at all. Um, and then they think it's it's a much more precarious type of exercise or process. But if you start off really light like this, it's almost like nothing you can do wrong. I can go like this with the worst you know possible application of ink that you can do, and you really can't even see it right there. So I'm see. So if you layer it like this you know, your lighting scheme starts to kind of appear. It's like a little bit darker in there because of that, you know, time you take with it. So, um, like when I teach, you know, like workshops or taught workshops, like live ones, I just have people really concentrate on that first color a long time. So they're not only coloring things, but they're kind of saturating the page a little bit, okay? Now I want this, I want this little area of light around here, but I don't want to tone in too much in it because I want those clouds to be capturing that light. But the thing is, if I don't use any color, um, that's not going to seem as light because if you add a little bit of contrast like that around there, let's say it's 5% darker, then that area in there seems 5% lighter by contrast. And I want there to be some nice light coming out of that. So even if I don't use um, some darker tones, you know, even just that little bit of um, color is you know, really good. I mean, you can just even stop at this one color right here. I think this is a really good um, kind of color scheme in here or shadow light color, you know, lighting scheme like that. See, when you color and then you retain some lighter areas within your piece, and it's not just for sky, it's for land or anything like that, grass or something like that, anything, okay? When you retain some areas of lightness, in your piece then you're coloring and lighting at the same time. Now, so here, I mean, you can see the differences between these two right here. Now on this one, I use some darker, you know, darker colors to begin with, but let's do the same thing on this one right here. So here's a layer of these clouds. And this one right here, I use the larger cloud cumulus. 
This one is just the same one, okay? But here's one layer right here, and here's the next. So that area of um, tone that I'll be adding in is right in between these two. You can see it's darker right there. Okay, so let's just go in here like this. And let's see if you can see it a little bit. Okay, now remember, I'm going to be adding in my lighthouse right in here, so... Um, but I can add in this first color, no problem, in here. Okay, now, and then I'll add in a little bit of a darker tone down here. Now, on the, my lighthouse, too, I have this crashing wave, so I'm going to keep that in mind. I don't want to tone that all out because it's like this splashing, kind of frothing, you know sea mist, you know, against those rocks down there. So I, I probably don't want to, you know, tone in too much around here, but let's add a little bit of tone right over here. If I were to buy um, Summer Sky, like if you, if you don't have that color, usually people have like a light blue in their collection of, you know, some brand of inks though. Um, but these days, if I didn't have certain colors, like especially like this one, I'm not really using this to make impressions from it's just too light you know it'd be good for this cloud i guess or something like that but you know it'd practically be an invisible cloud um if it was that light so i would just get um the re-inker for this color and i just put a couple drop drops on that i don't really need the re-inker and pad for a lot of different colors that i use so um I don't know, at some point in time, I stopped buying um, pads for a lot of colors that I didn't already have, and I just get the re-inkers. Like a lot of the distress inks or the, um, oh, I, I don't know if I got some mementos too. There, there might be a couple mementos that I just have the re-inkers for. You know, because I already have enough colors um, to make impressions from. Hello, Jeannie! <laughs> yeah, watching the, uh, the videos, um, the Stampscapes live streams has, um, it's been reported to have healing qualities. <laughs> Maybe it's because we heal when we um, we're, we're sleeping, right? So um, my videos tend to put people into a, you know, tend to put people to sleep. So yeah, you know, healing qualities as far as that goes. Okay, but do you see that right there? So, I mean, it's not like a big difference between... You know, if I hold these two up right next to each other, you can see some, you know, some of the uh, the tones in here. Um, it's a little bit more developed in terms of our, I don't know, kind of lighting scheme in here. I'll add a tinge of um, some other colors in here so we'll on one of our one or two of them so we'll kind of um expand on the um the hue range of the piece or temperature range I, maybe a little bit too so on one of these i'll add like specifically maybe a little bit of pink highlighting in here or something like that and i'll show you what that looks like so we're just kind of extending the range of these pieces when we add darker tones so we're extending the value range um, light and dark and that makes for a richer um, potentially richer surface if you extend the um, temperature range a little little warmth in here or something like that that could be the temperature range the hue range would be going into like a little bit of a additional color um, you can do that if you have a really really light um, alcohol ink or something like that you can put it some in the clouds or something like that you know on the glossy card so i can kind of blend it around a little bit okay so that was the memento summer sky let's go to the bahama blue and the bahama blue is the color that we use to make the impressions of the clouds on these two pieces here 
um, I think this one was all the number 10 Marvy right there. Okay, let's go with the Bahama. The Bahama blue looks like a, from the, um, the pads right here, it looks like they're roughly around the same value, but they're not. The me mementos, the, from my experience with the memento inks, they're much lighter than the, um, the indexing would um, indicate. Hello, Vintage Scrap Girl. Christine, good to see you. I took a nap this afternoon. <laughs> you got prepped, huh? Did anyone, did anyone take like a Red Bull? <laughs> Or coffee. Okay, so see this right here? I'm kind of, I'm not adding this exactly in the same areas that I added the last tank. Oh, by the way, so that was the summer sky right here. And this is kind of roughly the, the Bahama blue right here. So it's a little bit darker than that, okay? But even when you start applying it to your page like this, I mean, this isn't, you know, we've, I've only laid down one color on there, but still, when you add this down, you're not adding a full saturation of this ink like it's, you know, like that right there. When you add it on with something like this or a sponge technique or something like this, you're adding like that amount there. That's, you know, Okay, so that's like 20 tamps right there. And see, that's like 50% of like a full saturation like that. So it's, it, you know, it's it, it's a relatively, you know, uh, I don't know. But it, this maybe that's not the description, but I was saying it's a relatively um, difficult thing to add too much of like, you know, this color right here. Okay. But I say that, but if someone has like their inks, I, I noticed a lot of people use like a really thick saturation of um, ink in their pads. Like they keep them really, really juicy. Okay. So, I mean, if this is a super, super juicy pad, I mean, you know, it'll leave like a stronger application of that color, you know, with the first tapping or application of it. So just be, you know, just um, be aware of kind of what state your pad is in and just how much of that ink you're applying it. And it would just depend on the, uh, the applicator that you're using. Um, like the, um, like the makeup style of um, uh, whatever ink applicators. <laughs> I say that they're makeup applicators, right? You know, those um, ones that everyone started using. But those ones would, you know, if you want to have like a really kind of gradual application of color, then those ones are a really good, you know, choice because it, they're like little hairs and they also kind of wick moisture. So they don't, when you add it down into your pad like that, it, they're, it's kind of wicking moisture. It's not, um, it's not absorbing a lot of moisture, so you're just getting whatever kind of gets stuck on the tip, and then you're just laying it down kind of in a really light application of it. All right. For me, that it takes a little bit of time to do that, um, so I don't use those types of applicators too much. I, I thought they would be pretty good for, um, like my darkest of tones, like on the perimeter of scenes, you know, when I was doing black, but um, I don't know, it, it takes me a little bit too long to do that. So um, I don't like to use them. I like to use something a little bit more absorbent um, so that when I ink up, I have more to transfer in a much faster kind of method. But if you like it like light and airy, real pastel-y looking, um, yeah, those are, those are a pretty good um, way to go. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, tr triple espresso for some people here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I started doing those. Um, so Vintage Crap Girl, uh, Christine was talking about the uh, the show and tells. You know, it, one of the things that occurred to me years ago was, you know, I was looking up, um, I was trying to find some information on Stampa Barbara, which was a gigantic store, you know, in terms of the industry, both in terms of inventory, but just in terms of what it represented. It was like the stamping mecca, you know, of the universe. People made pilgrimages there, you know, basically from out of state. They would go and, you know, to, they would come to the Carson Stamp Convention, which was the convention at the time. And they would often drive up to Santa Barbara from there, you know, which was like an hour and a half, basically, from, you know, that Los Angeles area. It depends where you were. If you're going to, like, the Carson Convention, it was, you know, it's basically an hour, hour and 20, eh, depending on traffic. But anyways, people would drive up there. Or people just uh, lived in L.A., they would go up there. Sometimes they'd spend the weekend and take classes from Kathy Lewis. But basically, okay, so that was, um, and that was a that was a store that basically carried just about every stamp company's stamps that were out there. Um, they had everything. Okay, but there, there's like zero information of them out out there on the uh, like the internet. Um, there was one photo of this guy standing out there, like you know, with his hands out, you know, he's visiting Stampa Barbara, okay. And it was, I think, it was the of the newer store too. It wasn't of these this older version of it um, that everyone loved too. It, yeah. So, and then I thought, I don't know. There was like a lot of stores that I, I should have taken photographs of when I used to travel them back in the days of film. Though I would have had to pack a, like a camera, you know, or something like that. But um, there were stores that were, weren't around. And I was thinking, well, that's the same thing for certain publications, too. Now, I've been doing show and tells of, you know, Rubber Stamp Madness, which is still out there. And um, Stamp or Sampler, as far as I know, right? Um, but uh, there's other publications that aren't, that aren't around anymore and with, like, no information on there. there maybe there's versions, you know, copies of it on eBay or something like that, but I don't know. In this industry, I mean, the, you know, rubber stamping hasn't been around for that long in terms of an art form, relatively speaking, so but it just seemed like a shame that there was, like, no information of a lot of these places or entities. So I thought, I, I mean, I, you know, I wish someone would do something, so I thought, okay, I, you know, I guess it's, you know, going to be up to me for right now. I don't know if you guys have like information, like something like that. You, uh, you know, you can press the, uh, <laughs> you can get these little, um, like camera holders that can just clip to a desk, and it, you know, you can arc it on over, and you know, just hit a video, and uh, you know, you can uh, upload that. But um, if you, I have like old, ma uh, old um, catalogs or something like that, especially for uh, some. Um, uh, companies that aren't around anymore. I, I would find that really interesting. I missed the boat though one time. Um, I didn't have a lot of catalogs from other companies, you know, because when I was at a convention, I went, I wasn't walking around. I was, you know, in the booth. So, and there were, you know, just some, you know, types of uh, imagery that I didn't really uh, collect in terms of my personal collection. So I didn't have like catalogs of them. But um, some people that used to go to like a lot of the conventions. Um, you know, they had like catalogs from every company. So anyways, I'm saying I missed the boat because um, one person that I knew that, uh, I don't think they're, I don't know if they're stamping anymore, but, um, but this is back in the days of like, in the 90s, um, when they were doing that, a lot of people were on the uh, AOL stamping group, you know, the live chat. Um, she found her, uh, one of the people in there, found like an, in a filing cabinet, I don't know, dozens and dozens of old catalogs. And um, she mentioned it and I said, uh, she said she's just gonna recycle them. And then I think I just, I don't know, I, I wasn't on Facebook or something like that or wherever she mentioned that. 
And uh, I just said, huh, you know, maybe you should save those or something. And then, I don't know, later on I logged in like weeks later and it was like, they asked me, hey, if you're, if you're serious about that, let me know. And it was like too late. <laughs> But it'd be cool just to document some, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, catalogs, especially. I think I did all of the ones that I had, which weren't very many, you know. All right. So, anyways, this is a bottom lit um, scenario here. So I have these areas of illumination within my clouds. This one right here, I don't think I used the. Did I? I don't think I used the summer sky. I think I just went straight into the Bahama blue here. Um, and I'm just, I'm not sure, should I go with one more tone? These are all coming together really fast. Let's, let's do one more tone. Let's go to this, um, Marvy Light Blue, and let's put a little bit of a darker kind of vignette, at least on the perimeters. I don't want to make things too dark in here. But just to kind of, uh, strengthen our lighting in here a little bit more. And just to kind of frame off the scenes a little bit more, I want a little bit of a darker tone, okay? That's what we that's what we aim to do here, Jeannie. It's the uh, what is that? The uh, it's the Friday Night Live slash ASMR slash um, you know sleep uh, sleep. Uh, uh, the in, the insom insomnia anonymous uh, groups uh, live stream. <laughs> uh, which I'm absolutely fine with, by the way. It's uh, it's not uh, um, any insult to me. Now that being said, um, one of the things that I was very conscious of was in the workshops, the live workshops, the workshops that were, it would always be a nine to 12 wherever I went as the first class. It was a three hour workshop. And that one to four class though, I really got people stamping really fast because it's just inherently kind of, it's right after um, lunch. Okay, so on the this color right here, I should explain what I'm doing right here. I'm just kind of going in and it's probably like if this was the edge of my card right here, I'm doing this type of thing right here. This is what it looks like basically. It's basically something like that, you know, but I'm doing it over the top of color that I've already laid down. Okay. So that, but that's roughly, you know, about the the distance I'm probably going in. It just depends, you know. I I, I go in a little bit further uh, farther normally, but again, I want these cards to be kind of extra light and airy. Now on this one right here, the lighting, the light scheme or the light source is really close to this edge right here. So on this edge, I'll just do a maybe like a little quarter inch application of this darker ink right there. Okay, so I wanted a little bit of it, but I, you know, I don't want to go right down to this, um, these lighter clouds down here because then they wouldn't be, you know, illuminated and reflecting some of that light. But you can see on, over here, I've gone in probably about an inch or so. Okay, but when I say an inch, I, I'm not talking about like going up an inch like that and it, having a hard line, it's, it's a transition you know, like that, it's, you know, a little bit darker on the edge and it's lighter in the middle. So you just go like this and you stay there a little bit longer. And again, it just depends on how wet your uh, pads are and your applicator is. But then when you go in here, it's just kind of a drier application. So you get that nice transition right there. So again, it's wetter on the outside. So it's darker on the outside. And then as you move in, just, you know, use a lighter touch use a drier applicator and then you get this transition of light going from light to dark like that. All right. Okay. Let's see it on this one right here. I think I already did it on this one. This one, I'm going to have um, some different tones in here. I'm going to have some or like earth tones in here. 
All right, this one right here. Let's see. See, I'm kind of making my way in here, but I'm not going in here and starting in that area. You know, I just kind of started off on the, the perimeter first and wipe off, apply some of the ink so it's getting drier on here. And then I just kind of go in this inside area and just use a real light touch, you know, get the feel of it, or you can see how much ink is left on there. And again, here's my darker area right here, or my lighter area. So I'm just going to do a little bit of an edge like that. And see, that kind of looks like it's glowing a little bit more. Again, the darker you make um, the areas around your piece, the lighter the light areas are going to seem, especially when it's kind of closer to it because it really contrasts against that uh, value a little bit more. All right, something like that. Now let's go and let's go ahead and go ahead and add in our uh, um, scenes or our imagery. Cloud, the clouds an image, you know, uh, but I'm talking about like the land masses or imagery. Okay, so this is I'm just going to use a dye based ink right here. Let's see. I said I was going to add in some additional tone in here just to kind of tweak it a little bit. I'm thinking about a pink in this one. All right, so I, I think I, I should add it in right now just because I don't want to add in light, a light pink in here because this might be wet for a while on here. And I don't want to add in some pink around there and kind of smear some of that black into the clouds, okay? So let's get this, let's take care of this one first. Um, oh, let's see. Seen if, uh, let me try this one right here. Not quite pink. This is orchid. I think I used to use a rose marie. This is rose pink. This one's a little bit of a warmer pink. I don't want that one. It has a little bit of yellow in it, but I had more of a neutral pink. Um, I see it right there, but it's at the bottom of my... Um, ink pad stack. <laughs> okay, I just want a little hint of this color in here. And it's just kind of for the video here too, for the live stream. I just want you to be able to see kind of a little bit of a difference in um, hue here. Um, just so you can see what the difference is between, you know, these three right here. And just so, I don't know, just for some variation right here. All right. Okay, I'm taking some of this down again. I don't want a, to apply a lot of this, and I want to have a lot of control. I can always go in with a thicker application of it, but when I start off right here, I just want to go in with a really light application um, to start off with here. So let's go like that. I kind of have it a little bit in the blue first because this overlapping the blue won't read as much it'll just be a little bit of a more of a violet tone and then i as i take more of this into the white it reads more as just the straight version of that color right there and i, I don't want to add it everywhere i just want to add like a little tinge of it here and there so it's going like this let's go really light right down here so i've been wiping this already kind of light version of it but you see that little tinge right there so you know it looks a little bit different these two are the ones that are kind of the most similar right here it's a little bit more full though isn't it you know so um another thing this is pinks right here so if you have like a distress ink antique linen i always keep bringing that one up because that one's a really super light tone but um that one's a really good one um you know, super, super light colors. So let's let's bring a little bit of warmth into this as well. So this is, you know, blues are, you know, a cooler spectrum hue. So if you want to kind of bring in a little bit of depth into, you know, that um, cool scenario right there, you can expand on the temperature range of your piece. 
and you can do it pretty I don't know it's, it's really like passively okay that looks kind of dark right there but it's not it's really quite light okay and especially again when you're adding it down like that so do you see, I don't know do you see that little warmth like that let's put it in some of our clouds like that now I still want white light in here but do you see the difference between there and like there Let's bring a little of this in here, like that, okay? Now where this would be good too, when I look at that color right there, sometimes people want like a glowing warm moon or something like that, this would be perfect for that. In fact, that looks a little bit better. I think I'm gonna do that on a couple of these, or let's do it on all of these right here. A little bit of this antique linen, okay? So I just want it to glow a little bit more so we have a little bit of that temperature change that's happening up there. It's really subtle, but that's the glow right there and that's stark white, okay? And you can see the difference, you know, between here and up there too. And if you want it really subtle, you can just add it down into the darker shadows and not add it into any of that white right in there. So you can just make your tones in there a little bit more varied and even like a subtle amount stands out quite a bit because it's a big um, temperature shift from only cool into a little bit warm so even a little bit warm really stands out now that's a little bit too extreme but i'm going to be adding my imagery over the top of that anyway so um, it's not extreme in terms of uh, you know, the amount of application, but in just in terms of how much it stands out. Let's see. I'll take a sprinkle donut, Froggy Fresh. <laughs> A maple bar. I'm trying to think if there's any donut that I don't like, you know. When I was a kid, it was always like a little sprinkle. <clears throat> I probably lean a little bit more towards um, uh, like chocolate ones these days. Okay, let's go with our imagery. But that looks a lot really colorful and it's like super subtle, you know, tones right now. But just that minimal amount of warmth like that. But wouldn't that be perfect for like a moon color? See, the thing about um, when you go with those really light tones like that, <clears throat> um, it doesn't darken the scene so much either. So you can really retain your light <clears throat> when doing something like that. All right, so here's the lighthouse. Standing up for this impression, um, the page isn't really that saturated with ink. You know, if I, sometimes I use, I don't know, multiple layers of a uh, color and big thick slathering you know saturations of it so um i hold my impression down a little bit longer in those cases so that i'm sure that this ink has stained in this case because that's the way dye based inks work by staining um, but they have to penetrate the inks that are already laid down on there okay but still i want this to be a nice and dark so you don't have to press harder, but just, you know, allow that ink to stain and transfer onto there. All right. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if I should do the little rocks out here to the side. Maybe I will. We have um, the um, rocks and waves stamp too. Okay. I don't know if I have that real handy here. I might have, I just, I had stacks and stacks of um, um, stamps and I've recently like put them back in their uh, 
in my uh, trays. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Okay, this one's going to be like the trees are kind of angled up at the sky, like we're looking from down below up at the sky. You can do it like this too, you know, where you're looking more just straight on. But on this one, I think I want to make it more kind of soaring and, um, I don't know, kind of uh, um, going back in perspective, more, more grandeur, I guess. Okay, so what we do for that, if you haven't seen me do these um, cards before, is um, you designate some little area on your piece. I mean, sometimes I'll make it like a dot there. I, I usually don't, though, but sometimes I do that just for reference that people can remember, you know, where I'm doing something like that. I'm not going to have so many images on this that I'm going to need to do that, though. But let's just say here's this little dot right here. Do you see that one? And I'm going to aim, you know, in this case, there's two trees right here, but I'm going to aim the dominant one right towards it. OK, I mean, you don't need a rule or anything like that, but just kind of generally aim it in that direction. Okay, and this will be for all of our trees. All right, and I'll do a, I'll do a couple different versions. Um, normally, I'd use um, my leafless pines as well, just you know, for some contrast. But I, I don't do anything kind of like, you know, like a dead tree, you know, like for a sympathy card, you know, it would just. It wouldn't be appropriate from a thematic standpoint. Okay, so um, here's the angle for this one right here. So again, this is pointing right towards that, and I'm going around like this. You can use um, however much you want. You know, you can go in there further, farther into the scene, like this. I I, I like to um, use different. Um, whatever heights of my trees just so that it's not the same exact you know um height you know it you want some variation in there okay now you see this little opening right here i'm going to leave that a little bit more open so that i can have some beams of light coming through some of these areas but i also want some beams of light to contrast against some trees in here as well but I'll leave kind of an opening in here for some beams to just kind of, you know, um, exit the uh, exit the composition from. All right, so this is going like that, and there's the little dot right there. Okay, I'll go with that. Let me do something right here. Let's add a little bit of variation right here. This is the uh, pine tree. This is the spruce. And I think just for a little bit of variation, let's go with, um, I happen to have this bottle green. Let me see if this bottle green pad is okay. Yeah, this bottle green's perfect. I hardly ever stamp anything out in this bottle green. And I guess I probably don't use it very much to color, so that pad's like, like I don't know, it's practically like brand new. It looks, it looks like, at least. So let's go with the... Uh, dark green in, in here. I don't know if you're going to see very much of a difference because bottled green is really, really dark. Um, but let's see how it goes. Um, let's see. Like that. Yeah. Um, that looks more greenish than black. Sometimes it's so dark, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. Especially if my background is darker and I stamp this bottle green over the top of it. If it's a lot darker, then the bottle green just looks like black practically. But since this, you know, area in the background is no more than like a 50%, you know, in terms of darkness, scale, you know, the value scale, then it stands out as green. Okay, let's go like that. And let's go for a little bit of a taller one here, I think. I 
you get a little bit of, um, you know, they're not contrasting shapes, but shape variations in here, okay? Now see, these are kind of all spaced out equally right here. And then I have the trees right next to it. So what I'm going to do just for some additional variation, it's, it's looking too much, um, you know, the same here. So what I'll do is I'll cluster, I'll bring in, um, all right, maybe another one of these um, spruce trees in here, but see, I'm bringing this one closer to this one right here. I started doing these um, kind of lay back on, you know, the ground, looking up at the sky type of um, scenes, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and I saw this company that came out with a design like this, okay, with that idea. And, um, but the problem is, is they didn't use the same vanishing point. They had their trees kind of going in all different directions, so they didn't understand the concept or perspective. <laughs> you know, so it was like, uh, okay, you got that right there, but you know, they needed to they needed to change that because it was all off. You know, you had these like this tree would have been like going this way, and this you know this one was over the you know they didn't they I don't know I, I don't think they didn't know uh yeah the basic perspective. So I thought, oh man. It would have been so much, but you know, they should have asked or something. But I like the, I like doing it with individual trees though, because you can, you know, you can vary things and you can have it specifically for the format of your card. But I guess they wanted it just in one fail swoop or something like that. Okay, so anyways, we have that. Uh, that looks a little bit weird. Let's go with another one like this. Um, I didn't come up with this thing, though. Um, let me see. What was her name from... Um, I think she worked for... Robin... Does anyone know the name Robin Beam? She worked at this place called... I think it was Trifles in Maryland. But then I thought she went to work for Ranger. Uh, Trifles was a retail store in um, Maryland. And then I thought she, I, she, I thought she might have authored a couple books too on stamping, but she did this really small piece in a, like a, I don't know, it was like a two by two or something like that. But she did those perimeter trees like that around a moon one time. And it was this was really small one. And then it was like, it was like, I don't know, it's like in a, some kind of metal framing or something like that. I think I still have that somewhere. Um, but that was really cool. But she came up with that idea of the uh, angled trees like that. Okay. It is like 30 years, I don't know, 25 years ago, probably. I went out and taught at like a retreat, I think, that was at the store. Some kind of special weekend event there. Um, and we, uh, they took a bunch of us um, instructors out for... Um, Maryland crab cakes. <laughs> I don't remember anything about the workshops, but I remember the crab cakes. The most important thing of the uh, the trip, right? Okay, so let's add in... This one's going to be like this kind of ranch kind of scenario right here. So I'm going to add in like a little of this dune right here. And then a couple of just... Um, a couple of the, the desert imagery around it. I like trying different foods from different areas. So um, I was, I don't know, there was like clear water. Um, Florida was in the news for some, I don't know, something came up on my YouTube feed. And um, uh, okay, let me see, what shit color do I do the, uh, let's just do this in black. I thought this might be a little bit too dark here, but I want my little figure to be walking off in the distance dark enough. I don't want them too light. Uh, let's just do this one right here. Uh, but yeah, like in Clearwater, um, I had a like grouper there. And in Cincinnati, it's that um, spaghetti. Or, uh, they don't call it spaghetti. They call it chili. 
Cincinnati, Ohio, because we went to that stamp convention there many times. So you order this chili. It's more like a... I don't know. It's, it's not what you'd think about chili in other areas, though. It's almost like a tomato sauce with, like, meat in it. And you order it, like, one way, two way, three way, whatever. Like, two ways is, like, with noodles, I think. And three ways, like, cheese on it or something. And then four ways, probably, like, onions. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, let's give this a little bit more of a foundation with some rocks in here. Or no, I want to hit it with some of these plants or cacti. Let's see here. I haven't done just like a really small thing using the uh, um, desert imagery yet. Just with like a really small, you know, area for my uh, desert images. Okay. Let's see. Shelly, what's that? Okay, I'm reading right here. Shelly, okay, yeah, are you talking about with that arrow there on the, the back of your stamp? It was all about scrapbooks in Dixon up here in NorCal between San Francisco. She has everything. Dixon. I don't know where that is in uh, the state here. I haven't heard of that city. I'll have to take a look at that. I started driving around um, at one point in time back when everyone used to use, you know, like hard copy maps and things like that. I have this atlas and I was um, at one point in time because I was driving around the state so much for both um, workshops and um, just doing things like hiking and trips like that. I started highlighting all of the uh, different interstates and everything like that. And I want, I wanted eventually just to, I wanted to have seen like all of California, at least, you know, major areas. Uh, uh, but that didn't happen, but, um, but I was making some pretty good progress on that. But Dixon, huh? Okay. A couple little saguaros here on the, uh to flank my piece right here. They're almost like, it's almost like creating like a foundation for, um, like if you did like Roman columns or something like that, you know, to frame the piece off. It's kind of almost a, 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 that kind of idea here. When you do these things like um, taller uh, trees or something like that on the, you know, on the, the left and right side, it's, it's kind of the natural kind of framing device. But, um, you know, just plants. I bought a lot of catalogs online way back for ideas. Ah. I'd say probably the most... What was the most extensive catalog most extensive catalogs got to be stamping up right um in terms of uh the stamping industry psx was probably pretty big too but psx um the psx one was just they didn't i don't think they retailed they just strictly wholesaled so um i don't know if too many people would have that like a psx catalog you know besides unless you were a store owner or something like that um but as far as like um, just the widely, you know, distributed catalog for, you know, just the stamper, the end user that, I mean, it would be stamping up. But I'm wondering, um, I don't know, maybe Candy, yeah, you can answer this or any of you that have like hard copy catalogs, um, who had kind of the most extensive um, catalog out there you know thickest in pages in terms of uh techniques and maybe samples maybe color printing too i don't know 
you know, besides, you know, aside from uh, stamping up. Someone just recently asked me if I had a, uh, um, a catalog for Holson, and I haven't had a catalog in years, um, just because we weren't going around to conventions and things like that anymore, and there weren't, you know, there's like less, you know, stores out there too, so when you used to have to get catalogs, you kind of 5,000 about was the kind of magic number from what I seem to recall. Or maybe it was 3,000. I think it was 5,000, though, just to get the price per book down to a reasonable amount. You know, the less, you know, if you just run like a thousand catalogs, the price per book might be, you know, twice as much, if not more, than if you ordered 5,000, but you just have to put down more money up front for that. So that's why also a lot of companies, you know, what you do is you produce a catalog. And then when you have new designs for a couple of years, you're not really putting out another catalog. You're just putting out a supplement, you know, because you don't want to run another whole, you know, big, um, you know, publication, you know, from start to finish again. All right, let's see here. So I don't want all Sawaros in this um, scenario here. So, um, by the way, I'm just leaving my tree on here because I don't feel like taking that off right now. But I'm just using the cling foam version of it right there. This side right here has the tag and peel on it. So I use my same acrylic blocks for um, um, you know, my cling foam or um, unmatted, bare and matted rubber. Okay, I don't want to use too much of this. I have to have my little figure kind of walking in the background, so uh, I have to keep that in mind. Maybe I should stamp them out, you know, right away or something like that. But um... go like that. I didn't use too much of that. I thought I was going to use a little bit more, but I thought it's kind of going to get in the way of my little figure in here. Um, that's walking in here. I'm going to use the, uh, the old man and dog image right back in there. Okay, so let's go for the, the smaller Ocotillo here on the, uh, the other side. I'm kind of just creating a little bit of a window here, you know, to put our little subject matter right here. You can see this is like my framing and it's kind of going, see this kind of angling like this? It all kind of points right towards, you know, where our subject matter is going to be. Or whatever, our focal point. You can see right there, here's all these focal points right here. I'm going to put some birds up here so everything's kind of pointing, you know, to that. My style has changed during the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, so, Candy, when you started stamping 30 years ago, were you doing a lot of embossing? Most people loved embossing, that's for sure. And there were other, like, a, what was a big accessory back then? It was things like little, like, heart punches were big. At least that Stamp of the Hand used the heart punch a lot on um, little gift tags and things like that. Um, okay, I'm not going to go look for my, um, I have these other rocks and waves. Or maybe, let me see if I have that real quick here. Okay, I have the, the set here. I was going to go look for my wood-mounted version of this, but I have the set, so. Um, rocks and waves. 
And I'm just going to use this right over here to the uh, the left of the uh, the main image. Okay, now this is going to be in black right here, but that's still it's still bold enough to stamp right over our light clouds. Now, if those clouds were stamped in black, you know, they might, you know, kind of show through this a little bit too much. But the fact that they're stamped in a much lighter color, you can just go right over the top of it. So again, I mean, we could have stamped out our imagery first, taking the time to really mask it off and everything like that. I, I find this to be much easier this way, though. Um, just less hassle, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, little, you know, types of uh, uh, whatever techniques. And again, these are tonal designs, so they're not outline designs. I mean, there's outlines around this lighthouse right here, but if all these things, things were open like that, then we'd be able to see our clouds right through it, but, you know. I draw from a, I draw tonally, so um, I won't have to do a lot of those, um, you know, different types of techniques to to build a scene or to build depth, you know, specifically, um, you know, because I prefer not to to have to do that. <laughs> so when I'm drawing, you know, when I'm working on designs over the years, um, yeah, I'm thinking of how they're going to be used or how I'm going to be using them too. And it's like, okay, if I do this right here, you know, in whatever scenario, um, am I going to have to do something else to do it? And, you know, if there's, if there's something else that I could do, you know, to prevent that, then I do. And specifically, it's like adding a little bit more tone into an area where it's a little bit more silhouette, but it's still rounded like that. Um, so I'll add those little things in there like accordingly. Okay, so anyways, we have this right here. Now I like to use little birds in my, um, in these types of cards. So I'm gonna add some of those into the pieces. Okay, so I'm not gonna do a raptor, you know, like an eagle. I mean, you could, but um, it's typically like little birds. So my, these are, this is the flock right here. And uh, the flock kind of represents like birds kind of soaring in like a little bit of a thermal, you know, they're flying around like that. And um, I'm going to add those in there. The gulls would be fine too. Um, but I like these. These ones are kind of like they're going up into the sky. Now I have both of these sizes out because sometimes I go with the larger one like this and I go with the smaller one up there like, you know, farther up into there. Let's do something like this too. Let's just kind of blot that off a little bit. And I'll have them a little bit over here, I think. Don't squash these, you know, this is very, you know, it's a small design. They're kind of all supported by each other, but you don't want to kind of you over, you know, too much pressure and get something like that, okay? So light even pressure. Now this one right here, yeah, I'm not sure if these larger birds are going to even show up right here because those clouds are a little bit darker, you know? So I might just go with the small ones again. I'm going to wipe off some of the perimeter ones like that too. Let's see how that goes. Maybe I'll blot it too. Like that. Uh, white pigment ink is going to go around these birds too, so they're going to look lighter. But I just thought, let's kind of expedite the process potentially. And those ones on the perimeter are a little bit drier and lighter like that. But the white ink is going to take care of that anyway. Okay, these ones right here. Um, let's see. I'm going to have my little figures down here so I'm gonna I don't want this like immediately over it actually I'm, I might leave these ones out of here because this is a desert scenario right here I don't want this to like look like there's a bunch of like vultures you know circling about that would be really bad in terms of a sympathy card I think <laughs> all right 
So let's here. Speaking of that, let's let's go ahead and stamp this little figure down here. I, I need to make sure that I'm using my black. I'm gonna put my bottle green away. Sometimes I grab my bottle green, thinking that's the black pad, you know, because it's so dark. Okay, let's wipe off the bottom of this slightly. Like that, like that. I'm gonna put them right up here on that ridge, I think. Like, that, like so. You can use a little bit more pressure on this one because this one's a thicker, more solid um, image silhouette. That. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, so we have these different scenarios right here, and I, I think they look okay, but for me, um, I haven't even added in kind of the spirit of the piece, um, which for me is going to be more of the airiness and lightness of the uh, the pieces right here so but on this one right here i need a little bit of tone um first and i'm looking at these impressions down here and i'm thinking they might be a little bit wet still so instead of adding in like some um i know i would use like an antique linen and the marvy brown um if i allowed this to dry just naturally a little bit more, but let's just kind of expedite it here and let, let me just add in some the uh, alcohol ink. Yeah, the impressions are a little bit wet, so I'm kind of smearing a little bit, but it would smear even more if I was using like a water-based, you know, on here. I don't care if this smears a little bit because it just kind of, it adds to the, the shading a little bit, but... Um, We won't add too much. I just want to get a little bit of tone, a little bit of um, color and temperature down that way. Let's see, let's go up a little bit. This is probably, yeah, it's a little bit way, well, that's like way too yellow. I need like a sand. I think that occurred to me in one of those last um, videos. Here we go, right here. Just like that. And this is a grayish brown, which I seem to use quite a lot. So look at this, I'm just kind of adding a little bit of a um, perimeter vignette, like I do with these up here, but I'm just doing it in this little bar down, you know, sand, like this down here. But uh, I still want there to be um, a little bit of an element of lighting down here, so it's just dark down here, instead of just coloring in the whole thing like that, like I was saying before. If you do kind of selective coloring and you retain some areas of light, then you're lighting at the same time. So, like, um, when people are coming from more of the, uh, like, outline styles of stamping, where you kind of fill in completely open fields, okay, of areas to color in. They're coloring it in uniformly like that. That's why a lot of people like, um, they want to, they always ask about, you know, does an alcohol ink blend, you know, because so, they don't want to have like, you know, marks in there, like uh, textural marks. Um, I tend to like that, but a lot of people don't. Um, but, if you retain some of those areas of light like that again, then you're lighting. We colored and lit this little area down here. Um, you know, at the same time, so you're just doing less coloring to uh, create a lighting scheme within a within a card. So that's that's for everything. You know, it, down here, I mean, we already had the lights and darks kind of inherently down here before we stamped this out. But remember, some of my clouds were lighter, so so you can see this. This wave right here is lit because it's, you know, a little bit lighter up here. This is, carries light right here. So these are two different images, but there's both kind of dark and light in there. And then let's say this whole area in the background is sky. So we have darker and lighter right in there. So if you just kind of leave your darks and lights in 
all of your different elements, I'm not talking about like silhouettes like that that are solid right there, but um, if you just kind of leave some light and darks on all of your different elements, then you're doing lighting in a scene. And you know, it doesn't have to be so formal like, wait a minute, if the light is coming from here, then is this gonna be light over here or would it be lighter right here? It doesn't really matter, okay? Just as long as you're kind of oscillating, you know, light and shade, you know, across your pieces. Now this one right here, this one's, you know, this horizon light in here a little bit more, you know, than this one, these ones, you know, the lighting is coming from above, so, you know, but it's the same type of thing. If this thing was upside down like this, you know, this could be a whole area up here that's being top lit, you know, you know, we wouldn't have the imagery up there like that, but, um, you know, it's the same type of um, process. You're just kind of retaining or defining um, light wherever you want it to be. So in other words, just don't color in everything, you know, if you want to, you know, that's, that's the basic thing. Just don't color everything in uniformly everywhere. So even in an area like this, there's a little bit of darker up here and lighter up there. And that was just by chance because that's where the cloud was lighter in the background. But you see this little area of light like that looks really good in the lighthouse, you know. And if it wasn't there, it's no big deal. But, you know, if that's just an example of, you know, that kind of just happening like that. Or, you know, variation, you know, is what it's kind of about. Let's see, I just gave away 70 magazines from some UK companies like Papercraft. Wow, that's a lot, Patty. That was like a subscription. Hello, Cecile. Good to see you. Good to hear from you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for, uh, 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 what are posting or whatever. Okay, let's add in some light into these pieces right here. So I like a lot of light in my pieces like this. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a sympathy card, but um, in this case, I think it's especially, um, you know, kind of appropriate or, you know, in terms of a kind of a mood or essence, you know, that we're trying to create right here. I'll do some beams in here too. I think those look really good in here too, but let's just kind of add in some variation. I, I think, I think it's nice to have soft light in here and that's where you do this. So if you're going to do this, what you want to do is you want to retain some areas of white within your piece. It doesn't have to be a big area of white. It could be like a really tiny one, but just retain it. Or if we're doing this on like a piece of dark cardstock, you know, and you don't have any white because it's, you're starting darker to begin with, you could create um, like a moon or a light source in the background, you know, with some white pigment ink and that becomes your white within the scene. Okay, so I, I know I say this on everything that sometimes, uh, you know, someone might be checking out a video for the first time, but this is white pigment ink and oftentimes a lot of people don't use white pigment ink a lot of times in their pieces. So if you have a white pigment ink pad, it's like, oh, I used to use it for um, embossing or something like that. Um, it might be like super, super juicy, okay? 100% cotton, cotton ball, not the synthetic ones, okay? It's not that the synthetic ones work a little bit were, you know, less than 100% cotton. I find they don't work at all for this uh, type of uh, effect. You need something that's going to absorb some of that um, moisture, which is the pigment ink, into your piece. You kind of blot it down so it's not all, you know, flaky, fluffy. And then what you want to do is you want to blot it off a little bit. If you have a black piece of paper or something like that, scrap paper that you can tap it on. I just, I know the feel of this though, and I don't, over ink my pads. It's a little bit dry on this one. I have another pad, but this one's I specifically have for my cotton like that. And then what you do is you start tapping it around in your light area. White on white, you're not going to be able to see anything at all. So sometimes people, when they do this, they start in that light area and they think nothing is happening. What's well, white on white, it'd be like tapping right in here. But what you're doing is you're taking it from that light area like that, and then you're transitioning it into those darker areas, okay? Or darker objects around there. So see that? I don't know if you can tell that. It's real, like real soft, but that looks soft too and I haven't added any. But let's creep this out here, okay? And it's like only through like a lot of taps can you just start to see it and that's the control you want over it, okay? And it doesn't take forever, you know? Like, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 taps, and it takes like 10 seconds or something like that. So, I can 
gonna say I'm just kind of bringing this up in here like that a little bit, but it's a really light amount, so it's not like a big slathering of uh, white pigment ink, so you can't see anything right there. But if I add it down in there like so, it starts to build up a little bit, and then look at that. You're bringing the light over here like that, okay? Now we're gonna oscillate it again too, so we're gonna go with some of this. So with lighting, it's like light, dark, light like that. This is adding light into there, but it's also textural. So I'm gonna go with softness right here. Now this whole area is kind of crisp up there, you know. I mean soft, you know, because it's clouds. But I like to, you, you won't be able to see what I'm doing right here exactly, but I'm adding some right here, but I'm gonna leave that as is right there. And then I'll come with some of it over here. So it's just kind of a textural change. And over here, it's just more of a subtle one because this whole area up here is fairly light. But here, you can kind of compare the two right here. Now, when I add it to this one, it's going to be more apparent because these clouds are darker. Okay, but let's see, right in here, let's have some of those birds in a little bit of light. So they're kind of being enveloped by light a little bit. See, these ones are a little bit darker right there. Um, the the kind of the mentality of this is you know you want to think about this we're applying a wet medium in here but you want to think about it like you're applying like you know like baby powder or something like that over the top imagine if you were using baby powder here that just happens to stick to your paper <laughs> but that's kind of the that's the the thought of it you know that you don't you don't want to apply like a thick slathering of it. Now I might add in some light beams in here, which will be more dynamic, you know. But see that right there? You can just kind of add however much you want. And if you ever add too much, just, you know, swing this around to your, you know, your other side and just wipe it right off and it'll come right off. Now, if you're doing this on a matte paper, it's going to stick to there and adhere to that much faster. But if it's on like a semi-gloss cardstock or a glossy like this, It'll come right off, but see like, like that? Look at that lighting coming through there and a little bit more. It's a little bit more textural and soft and kind of luminous. There's, uh, this pad is called Brilliance right here, but you can use any um, pad you want. But I was gonna say, it's more of a brilliant light that's running in there. Okay, now, remember where I said we're adding it where light meets darker, okay? Let's add it down here into these crashing waves as well so you can see from a textural standpoint what this adds to this piece right in here, okay? So this is a light area right in here, so I'm gonna add in some of this. I have a little bit too much on those pads, so it's adding a lot right now. And plus it stands out much stronger over a you know, black object, crisp object like that. But you can see how that kind of um, affects um, how that looks. See if I add it in too much, I can just kind of blot it off. You can blot it off with your finger a little bit like that. But let's try to transition this a little bit. Let's add a little bit more at the base right down here. And I'll add a little bit less right up in here. Um, add around like that. Everyone always adds in way too much when they first start doing this. It's like, oh, okay, you know, I, and it's because when they add it down like that, it's like they can't see anything and they want to see some results like immediately. But if you just kind of like spend another, like, what is that? I don't know, like five seconds, then you get that right there. But it's the right consistency. I mean, you can do things faster, you know. I'm kind of explaining things for the, those that haven't done this before at all, you know. When I tap this in here, I can just go right in here because I know the touch to bring in it and I know where to apply it first. So I can just kind of add it right in like that. But, you know, if you if you haven't done this before and you want to give it a try, you just want to do it nice and um, kind of methodically, okay? Sometimes when I used to do this too, I almost kind of remove as much ink as I apply because I would be typically like adding in too much um, because it's really fun to do. And it's like, look at that softness like around in here. So it's like soft, crisp, soft like that, or light, darker, light like that. Let's bring a little bit of that. See, there's a little bit of light right back in there. Um, 
So let's add, let's have some of this fog kind of creeping around. Some of that lightness right back in there, that illuminated light. Let's bring it around. Let's kind of illuminate it even more like that. Okay, but let's bring some of that light creeping around those rocks like that. So it's like coming around like this so that you have a little bit of this illuminated moisture in the air, you know, as mist. So suddenly this lighthouse is kind of enveloped in that lighting like that now. So it looks a little bit more three-dimensional. So a lot of times we make things look a little bit more three-dimensional and deep in landscape stamping by layering imagery like this. Well, this is kind of layering mist, okay, and light like that. So, see like that right in there. See how kind of soft it is right there. You can com compare the two of them like this. Now this one again was stamped in lighter blues than this one right here. So the blues are a little bit more, see this looks, you know, fairly soft to me just inherently. And I think it looks fine as is, but let's take a look and see what it looks like with some additional texture like this, okay? So I'll start it in my light area like this. Look how, see how, look at that cloud like that compared to like over here. Um, Sometimes I start doing this and when my ink is still a little bit too wet. So it's like if you start picking up like some blue or whatever color you're doing this over the top of, um, I don't know, maybe heat set it a little bit first or something like that if you're worried about that. So you know how I'm going from darker like this when I'm doing, um, you know, paper towel, you know, applications of ink. I'm going from dark to light. I'm going from dark to light like this, so wet to dry, dark to light. Well, in this one right here, I'm going from light to dark like that, okay? So it's like tapping it around in there. Let's see this little area right here, and there's a little bit too much of that blue ink right there, so I'm just gonna knock it back, you know, quite a bit like that. We'll put it over some of these birds like so. But look at that super soft lighting in there. Doesn't that lighting look more dimensional now though, too? So this is right here, I'll leave that as is, but let's have some of that light coming out here like this, like it's really kind of spreading out and coming out at us. Look at that like that, see that right there? I mean, putting some on my tree, like that tree is kind of um, reflecting some of that light. This kind of, you know, gets, you know, some of my, you know, impressions in there weren't the best, you know, it was a little bit too dark, you know, in the background. Like I said, that, you know, that stamp pad was kind of crumbling on me. So this kind of smoothed all of that. It kind of remedied all of it, but look at that lighting in there now. Let's hit some of this down, right down, down in here too. It's a little bit lighter down here from that other layer of uh, clouds. See this tree right here is kind of reflecting some of that light or this one right here. Now it's instead of it being black, it's a little bit grayish. See this one right here. Let's put a little bit of light on that um, tree top right there. Maybe I'll do it on like one side of the tree like that. Yeah, so it just kind of everything's kind of going up into that light right there. Okay, now this is also, um, it's going to dry a little bit more darker than what it looks like right now. Um, so I'm going to apply a little bit more than I think I'm going to need. I'll, I might go with an, even another layer um, 
afterwards. I'll see what it looks like when it dries. Now I'm using Brilliant Sync so it dries really fast, but even if you're using like a Hero Hues, this is a water-based fast drying pigment ink. Okay, it's not super fast drying. Um, you know, I still have plenty of time to manipulate it. If I want to remove any, I can still do that. But um, other types of pigment inks, they're known Okay, um, to not dry on glossy cardstock. Okay, um, but I used them for on the, the in this way for years, and it's because if you stamp out an imagery in like a you know Hero Arts Hero Hughes white or something unicorn white, if I stamp it on there like this tree on glossy cardstock, it's probably not going to dry. I'm going to have to emboss it or something like that. But when you're adding such a thin layer like this it I don't I never had any problem with any of the uh, other brands drying and I didn't used to use brilliance white for this purpose um, I used to use um, like color box um, frost white more see I added a little bit too much right here it's like go like that all right so a little bit more dimensional like that texturally dimensional and illuminated like that Okay, now this character right here, let's do, let's create this region right in here. Let's create that a little bit softer or bits and parts of it. And I'm going to illuminate some of these, this cacti in here. Okay, so we'll put some of this on here like that. And I'm also going to have that character kind of going off into the light, too. So I want to envelop that character a little bit more with lighting. Okay, so I'd zoom in here, but it, it'll go out, out of focus on me. So let's just do it like this. Okay. So again, I'm not doing it over the whole image. I mean, you could, but I think it looks better if you kind of oscillate it a little bit more. And see on this top ridge right up in here, it's like they're, you know, going into the light, you know. <laughs> it's a reference to Poltergeist, but that's not what's happening here, right? Uh, one of my friend's dads had a, like a ranch, you know, down in uh, Mexico, and um, he died. But anyways, so he's kind of going off there like that. But see that lighting right there? I think that looks really good like that. Okay. Bring us some softness up into these. Um, clouds up above, like so. All right, now let's see on this one right here. I think that looks pretty good like that. Let's add in, and it, okay, so for me, from a visual perspective, if, if these weren't like sympathy cards, I would go darker on the perimeters like that, but I wanna keep things nice and light and airy, so I'm keep, keeping them lighter. Now the light, uh, the windows in this lighthouse I'm going to white out with my acrylic paint pen as well as the light right up in here. So I'm going to reclaim the lightness, the whiteness of my paper just with this pen right here, okay? And then let's give it a little bit more highlighting on some of these rocks right in here. About like so. And I'm going to hit these two with some... Um, splatter painting and I think these little kind of light it just suddenly started raining here I did hear that we're going to have some uh, potential thunderstorms but man it was like sunny and warm like an hour ago okay let's see here all right okay light beams all right um, straight edge paper, two pieces, 
and you're going to create um, or designate a vanishing point for this lighting in here, okay? And we're going to create these crepuscular rays coming from some areas. So in here, I'm going to have that coming from maybe the middle leg on that horse right there. And let's go like this here. And I'm going to create some beams of light coming from that area, um, emanating from that spot. And I like to do it, one of the things that I learned to do that I wasn't doing early on when I started doing these light beams was I wasn't varying them, so I'd create this like really thick solid one. And again, which is fine too, but I thought it looked more kind of natural or graceful if I varied it a little bit. Um, in terms of opacity. So, okay, so here's one beam. You can't really see it on here, and this isn't going to be super obvious because this is a really light background in here that I'm doing it in, but I just think it, it'll add in a nice kind of element to it. It's kind of a happy type of, you know, kind of or peaceful type of um, visual scenario here too. Okay, so I'm going to vary this a little bit. So I'm going to go right a little bit right here like that. Okay, and then I'll add in a little bit more out here, but I won't do it over the whole thing. Maybe a little bit more really on there, but this is a little bit of a thicker beam, so I'll kind of have a little bit more of a, you know, some of this ink like in one area of it. So it creates a little bit more of a, like a, like a varied beam. I don't know if you can tell, but it's a little bit more opaque in some areas, and then it's less opaque down here. You can see more of the clouds through it. And that's the way, you know, Kind of, I see that lighting, um, those crepuscular rays tend to look because they're going through objects, clouds, you know, whatever. You know, the light is getting broken up a little bit. The beam. Okay, so it always just kind of emanate from the same spot again. You know, that same vanishing. But let's go a little bit wider here like this. Okay, so again, this, you know, it would be a little bit too kind of... Uh, um, bold if I did this, you know, super opaque and uniform. So let's just do it like this and see what it looks like. If you get a beam too that you don't like, you can just, again, you can just wipe it off. You see how that's going like that? You know, this on this one, that's really kind of subtle, you know, um, you see these lines like that, but I think it looks pretty cool. I think another one kind of coming over this way or we can have it going in front of this cacti down here maybe. And I tried to have it not so symmetrical, too. Again, so let's do this right here. Sometimes you see the angles and it's like, really, is that the angle right there? You know, because it looks kind of strange. But uh, but if you're using the same kind of vanishing point, um, it'll always be correct. So, so I'm going to I'm putting this right in front of that cacti. I can put it behind some of the cacti, too, like so some of the beams are going in back of it and some in front too and you, know, you can have another beam like go completely in back of it so some of the beams are coming in front and some behind okay all right something like that maybe that one's like too is that one too thick maybe that one's a little bit too thick, so I'm going to put another one right here. Or I could just wipe off some of it, but I think I'm just going to put another beam, <clears throat> but make it a little bit more narrow. The beams are going to look really awesome on that, uh, that pine tree one. This one's like super, super subtle. I think this is the most subtle beams I've ever done, because I usually make my sky areas, at least in some areas a little bit, um, are a lot darker. But I think that looks pretty good um, on there in terms of effectiveness like that. See this beam right here, I have it behind that one so it's in the background. This one's going a little bit in the, you know, in front of that cactus. And I just one in front of that cactus it looks kind of weird. Let's go like this here. 
Let's do a real narrow one right here, right in front of uh, those Suaros. Okay, so we have that. And then, see, laying down my paper over the top of that, it was probably getting that a little bit. It was probably remo <clears throat> removing some of that white ink down there. So let's remo uh, reapply um, some of that white pigment ink right in there. Think about like so. Let's make that a little bit softer right up there. Okay. It's a little bit more dynamic like that, you know? It, it gave it more direction, too. All right, on this one right here, <clears throat> we'll have some of these beams coming right down here and streaking down here and going in front of some of these trees. Maybe I'll have it like this. It doesn't always have to be like around every, in every which direction, okay? You can have like one beam if you want to or something like that, too. Um, so it's whatever you want to do. Okay, so this one right here, let me go with, uh, I'll designate the top of that little hanging billow right there, the middle of it as my, no, everything's going like right. What did I use? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I used that one. I forgot I already had a vanishing point in this one. It's that little dot of ink. I used some white pigment ink over the top of it so I can barely see it now, but it's like that little dot right there was my vanishing point, so... Okay, so here, so I'm not going to add the white pigment ink all the way up to that because this area in the middle is like white, okay? So you're just adding it wherever the color starts, okay? So right here is where that color starts. And let's add some, let's weaken it a little bit right here. And then let's go a little bit stronger down here again. And maybe I'll kind of... And I call it like curtaining it where it's like, in this case, it's lighter on one side and darker on the uh, another side. Okay, so it's, it's just transitioning it like that. See how that transitions from that to, and it kind of fades out right there too. And there's a little bit more of it right there too. But I, I really like that look there. And it, it, again, I, I wasn't doing that like right away. It was like, I, I think I look. I observed some light beams and photographs, and it's like, okay, those ones really kind of like, it. You see it, and then you don't see it, and then it reappears again, you know. Um, and I thought, oh, okay, that looks like much more natural. Especially if you have like, your beams going through like some like a you know a wooded area or something like that. Um, you know, you don't even have to have the sky in the in the scene. Okay, right, right here. So it'll really show up right in front of these branches right here. So let's go like this. Let's add some right there. And then let's add some down here and see what that looks like. And then I'll kind of see that right there. It's some right here, none, some. I don't know if that, you know, if it doesn't look good, then you can just add some more. So you know, it's kind of breaking it up like that. And it looks like a real natural, like, light beam to me. Let's do this right in here. We have a big cluster of, you know, some dark trees in here. Um, let's just kind of vary them a little bit. Let's try this one right here. Let's add some of it right in here. Like where the trees kind of start. And then I'll transition this off to where there's some light right in here. But I'll transition it off into nothing down here. So is that beam like that? You know, instead of just going all the way down to the base, that one looks pretty good. It's the strongest one in there, so I think I'm going to add in, like, another strong one somewhere just to kind of balance it out a little bit. But um, let's do this right here. And how about a wide one like that? But where it'll show up mostly is right in that dark area darker areas, which is not very dark, you know, but it's kind of light blue. Let's add it in there. That. 
Yeah. And let's bring an, another couple like around on right over here. One, one of the things I was thinking about was um, someone is going to come up with a light beam template, like a plastic um, template. <laughs> you know, with ver you know various widths, uh, which you know, it, I think it'd be okay. But um, I don't know. Having something like nice and thin like this, you can get right next to that area like that, and you can make it as thin or thick as you want it to be. Like that. Okay. Let's see. How about? I think that is it. That. I was thinking about a real narrow one somewhere in here, but I think that's all I want to do. This is looking at a little square up here. I'm going to add in somewhere this white pigment ink right around in here. Look about like that. All right. And let's do it on this one as well. I think this looks fine as is, but I think eh, I think it looked better with the the beams. I I, I I totally forgot. I think this was the direction I was gonna thinking about going in this one. See, this one already looks like little beams coming down there. So let me go with that area right there as my little vanishing point. It's just this little area between the billows. Like that. And then let's let's have one nice and bold going right in front of the lighthouse. It's kind of interesting because the lighthouse would be sending out, you know, a beam, but in this case we'll have the um light in the sky as the uh the source of the uh the beam, the beam of light. I'll just have the the lighthouse kind of glowing. Something like that right there. So see, that's another thing right there too. Now the, uh, the lighthouse is kind of set behind something. It's not, you know, an actual image, but it's just, um, you know, in this case, some white like that. So it's kind of sits into the scene a little bit more. And then let's do that thing where we, um, we have a, um, a beam going in front of, but also behind the lighthouse, okay? And you can just do it really lightly if you don't know, you know, if, you, you're, if you're you're gonna like it or not. You can just start it off very pale like that. And let's do a real kind of narrow, sometimes I do my narrow beams, my sharper beams, a little bit um, more opaque. Let's try that right here. It's like maybe it's, I don't know, it's more kind of focused and less uh, diffused maybe in terms of the theory of it being a little bit more opaque, I don't know. Something like that. See, it's a little bit lighter like that instead of like broken up, maybe. I don't know. But I'm just see. Should we go with one more? Let's kind of keep it kind of going that way instead of going down this way. Let's keep it kind of at an angle like that. Let's go with one more out this way, I think. Something like that. As I look at this, it's like, uh, you can all, I can only kind of tell until I do it, but uh, 
It's like, uh, I need a little bit more here. Oh, okay, let's do this one really super, super light right here. Okay, something like that. All right, so we have light and a very soft kind of um, application on all of these. And what I'll do now is we'll kind of, um, I don't know if it's balancing it out, but it's just adding, um, it's varying it a little bit more um, in terms of like little crisp, you know, lighting applications. And let's do it with the, uh, the splatter painting here, okay? Um, and I'll have that kind of coming out, like light is coming out like that. So this is really diffused and soft and light, and this is going to be very crisp. It won't show up too much because it's, um, you know, it's light on very light, but um, I think from a directional standpoint, it, it should be kind of interesting. So in other words, I'll have it kind of splattering kind of from the direction of the, the main light sources. All right, so just a little bit of paint on the tip of your brush. You don't want to soak the whole thing. And then I'm removing a lot of it, okay? So splatter painting. We're going back to like kindergarten here with the splatter painting technique. So I, I tend to move it in the direction that I'm going to be splattering it in, uh, in a situation like this. So I'll kind of come from this way like this. And again, I'm not going to be able to see a lot of it because this is so light down here, okay? I barely see it on this one. Like I said, I usually go with much darker uh, backgrounds right here. I need more paint. I always just kind of apply a little bit at a time because you can always add more like salt in cooking. <laughs> Yeah, I can barely see it up here in that sky. Oh, okay, I can see it now. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you can see it right here texturally. Like I said, it barely shows up in this one. But I'm going to splatter down here in these crashing waves too, okay? Um, crashing waves, um, waterfalls at the base of waterfalls. Um, this looks really good. It makes it nice and kind of frothy and... Oh, uh, kind of texturally interesting when you do that, okay? So I've added that right down in there, and I don't know if you can see those little splashes. You can do, you can add this, these types of things down into your piece um, with a paint pen or a gel pen if you want to do like exact little spots. If I'm adding a lot of something, though, this makes it kind of nice and quick and kind of random. A little bit or more, more varied okay here I'm going a little bit more down there so I don't know if it seems more a little bit more active but then you get light over darker areas like this you get these little spots of like sparkly light that's reflecting that light down in these areas and I don't know if you can see that but I got a little bit of splatter kind of coming down here but it looks like little you know light um, kind of coming down from whatever that you know the heavens Around this one right here, let's do it from the bottom up, right here, and it may, maybe it's coming across here a little bit more too. But it's like sometimes you know, like at sunsets or something like that, you you see more kind of sediment in the air because it's like colored light. Well, that's not this case, but. I see more of this like white light kind of coming out at us here. If it was a darker scene, this works really great for snow and stars, you know, nighttime types of scenarios. Okay, now this one right here. This one, this one will show the most because we have, you know, these solid, you know, black trees in here. And if I get any over the top of them, you know, we'll be able to see that um, contrasted on there a little bit more. Uh, 
like I said, I'm usually doing this on a much darker background so I can see it more. So here I'm getting a little bit bolder. I'm going more with like a, I usually just kind of release a couple of hairs at a time, but on this one I'm releasing like a lot of them. But do you see that right there? Texturally, you see all that kind of white coming down here? So it looks like that, you know. And I'll illuminate some of these too. I'll put a little bit of a glow around some of these larger um, splashes of paint, okay? Um, all right, so it's all about that soft lighting in there. And like I said, this is kind of like a little bit of a crisp lighting because it's a spot of like really opaque um, dots of white, okay? But if you have these elements of crispness within the piece, just by making something a little bit darker, the lighter areas seem lighter, but adding in something a little bit crisp over the top of something soft, it makes the soft look that much softer. Now this one, I mean, it's really quite subtle, but you know, again, it's kind of just plain contrasts against one another. Um, if you want something darker, you know, you can have something lighter next to it, you know, or if you want something lighter, you put something a little bit darker next to it, soft against sharp, you know, things like that. And it just, it, br it brings more emphasis into the piece or, or whatever, uh, into the, uh, whatever aspects you're trying to emphasize. So in these ones, you know, it's light against dark and crisp against soft. And I do, I do this on all my pieces too. It just, it's just like a fun little technique to do. Um, it's kind of addictive. So it's not like a, it's not like tedium at all uh, for me. Okay, so see this right here? We have these um, little splashes of paint in here. Sorry, I haven't been reading the, uh, the uh, chat here. Uh, what do you clean my, I clean my stamps just with water. Hello, Harold Hodgkins. I had lobster up in Maine, speaking of going back to what I was talking about with uh, eating in certain areas. <clears throat> Whenever I see lobster, I think about that uh, uh, eating out with uh, Harold and Linda Hodgkins uh, in Maine. So they took me out to with lobster, and I kind of joke about it a little bit too sometimes because they said, well... If you're getting like whatever it was, like what do they start at like a pound and a half or something like that or whatever. And they said, well, you know, if you just get the like the next one up, you know, the shell's going to weigh the same anyway. So you're just, you know, the next pound, you know, half pound up, it's just like all meat. <laughs> but it was a big, gigantic lobster. I remember thinking, man, I've, you know, I'm like halfway through this thing and, uh, I don't want to waste it, you know, and I was thinking, man, I am really full in it, you know, I was thinking, there's this gigantic claw, you know, still, um, but I, I'm pretty sure I ate it, you know, but, you know, I couldn't take it back to, uh, you know, the, the inn with me, it, there wasn't a, like a refrigerator and stuff, and plus I was teaching at the store, you know, the next day anyway, so it's like I'm like eating like leftovers in the room. And you don't want to waste lobster. Okay, so here's like a little... Um, these little kind of orbs of light look really good in the beams too, you know. That's one of my favorite places to add them in there. So, okay, so if I don't get a splash in there, I just add it in with my pen like this, okay. But let me bring some of these little orbs to life a little bit with... Uh, a little bit of this pigment ink around them and you just kind of add it in nice and slowly. Don't put a big blob of paint on them, okay? So this one right here, you'll be able to see this one much easier because it's in a darker area like that. These look great for like glowing stars too. You know, you add a, a little bit of a glowing kind of um, perimeter on some of them that that really adds a nice textural touch um to your pieces i had that on my aurora borealis one so this this is the splatter painted stars in this um holographic right here but those that little bit of that glowing pigment ink 
on a couple of these stars right in here really changes the uh, the spirit of that sky and it makes it look more varied and again it's crisp against soft right all right so in this case those don't represent stars but you see these like orbs of light coming out like that okay and let's do it on this one here too in a couple areas it kind of adds a whimsical kind of magical touch to the um you know the the scenes too i find so they always have like these little um in animated movies you know these are like these little orbs or something like that kind of floating around like in disney movies All right, so on there, okay, this one's like really super light, so you can't really see anything on there. All right, these cards are, you know, these cards to me, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll format all of them. They're all going to be on white, and almost certainly I'll put um, like a silver perimeter on there. Uh, I don't know if I have some silver cardstock here, but it'll look more like, it may almost be kind of interesting to use a little bit of a, like holographic. Nah, holographic, like that's too... That'd be tacky looking for the uh, cards like that. So I might do some kind of word stamp up here too, but um, I, I, I don't have a piece of like silver card stock here so I can show you, but I don't know. I've formatted a gazillion of my pieces on silver before. So um, I just think that something simple like that will be really nice on these pieces right here. But my eye tells me I'd like to go a little bit darker on here. But again, in the spirit of, you know, these cards right here, I'm just going to keep it really, really light and airy looking. <clears throat> and I just want to focus. For me, these pieces are all about like, these areas, like right in here, you know, with that lighting coming through like that. And that's the look that I'm going after. I want the softest of light and oh, like a lot of it, you know, instead of um, kind of a little bit more balanced, it's really focusing on that. Now, like I said, the framing like that up there again, like you could even see it against my board like that, but the silver has kind of a darker element to it and it adds a little bit of a, oh, it's kind of a, a nice um, elegant touch to these pieces and um, it's my favorite combination with um, blue tones like that. So anyway, go with these. Look, I'm looking at these like in a trio. It'd be kind of interesting to do like three pieces in um, with these light beams like that and have it in a triptych format, you know, where you display like three pieces together. I might have to do that sometime. Or like on ATC sizes, I think that'd be perfect. You do like three ATC size cards in a row. Maybe, you know, something like this. It can even be this, you know, this element like this. But the but the theme, are, it would be the beams in there. So you can have these beams coming out in, like, um, like a series of three pieces like that in a triptych. Might be kind of interesting. <clears throat> the clouds and the dunes, yeah. The uh, vintage crap girl uh, mentioned... I've been out, you know, when you when you're out in the, so like Death Valley, I love going out in the dunes out there in this one area because they're so white and uh, just like pristine. Um, but I love how the way those look against the, uh, you know, the sky out that way. Stampin' Up! just celebrated 36 years this year. Wow. You have a 20 to 25 catalogs. Wow. That's a lot. So Stampin' Up! Yeah. Okay, I asked this before, but um, I can't remember what Stampin' Up! Stampin' Up! Was, was Stampin' Up! Dots to begin with? Dozens of terrific stamps? I can't remember. One of those entities started off as Dots, though, and then it turned into something else. I can't remember uh, which one that was. Oh, catalogs. It's the Sears and JCPenney catalogs. Yeah. So we used to go through that um, Sears one... Um, all the time and just drool over those uh, 
uh, all of that uh, those catalogs out there. I was telling someone, um, I was telling my wife about this story that I read on this um, CEO. You know how you can get miles, you know, mile rewards on all of your, uh, on your um, credit cards? It was talking about, there, I read this one story about how, this is 20 years ago or 25, I don't know, maybe, maybe longer than that, but I read this story about how someone on an unlimited mileage card racked up, you know, a gazillion miles is because they charged their company credit card with the purchasing of this, all of their catalogs. And then the way they were describing, they they didn't say who, you know, because it's a whatever privacy thing, but I was saying that had to be Sears that they were talking about. So they just charged... (laughs) They charged the uh, entire um, catalog production on their miles cards. So <laughs> they must have got like millions and millions of miles, um, you know, with that one printing of that one um, thing. Because Sears was like the, you know, the catalog at the time. So I was almost certain that it was, it was um, Sears, you know, which is why somewhere along the line, the credit cards um, with mile you know, points or whatever, that system, um, they changed it to, um, you know, there was a limit on unless, and yes, you pay a certain amount, then, you know, it was unlimited miles that you can, um, that you can get. Oh, hello, Linda. Yeah, I didn't see, uh, we lost you there, huh? PSX Hero Arts, uh, yeah. Uh, now, see, uh, yeah, so the, the PSX uh, catalog was available to, to anyone then? I, I seem to remember seeing that PSX one out there, but I wasn't sure if they were just sending those out to um, stores or not. But if I, I never saw, I don't think I, I might have seen PSX at one or two conventions at one point in time, like in the, maybe the late 80s or maybe like 1990 or something like that. But I think even by then they weren't going to shows you know, I'm trying to think if they were at Carson, like in 87 or something like that, 88. Hello, military mom. Good to see you. Uh-oh. Power's going out with Linda. Got to crank up that, uh, crank up the, um, the generator so you don't miss a, a, a second of the, uh, the all-important Stampscapes live streams. <laughs> Oh, your great granddaughter's fourth birthday. Ah, oh, fun. Check you checked your phone. Oh, hello, Bill. Yeah, it really uh, simple cards, huh? You know, Linda here with the uh, clouds and the simple desert one. You know, like I said, for me these pieces are the same things kind of going on in all of these right here. It's just a matter of you know what you're doing in the foregrounds, but. It's like the technique is all the same on these ones. If And if you really break down kind of my methodology with a lot of my pieces, not with every um, type of um, scenario, but it's kind of the same. It's, you know, if you look at something like this right here, I mean, this is not clouds or something like this, but this is a piece of um, the matte cards you know the semi-gloss card stuck we can see it's just darker on the outsides like this and then i have my lighter area in the middle somewhere and do you see this where i come up with the little pigment ink in there so i go dark to light on the perimeters okay and here's an object right here it's you know a little bit dark you know but we oscillate it we go dark light dark like that well this is like you know in the clouds like it's it's like dark or light dark light like that right and then you go um with the white pigment you just kind of hit in here and you just go light to dark like that out there so dark to light and light to dark like that dark to light pigment inks colored pencils whatever and from the center you just go with white to you know darker like that so you do it the opposite way um the white pigment ink is a little bit more translucent to opaque and oftentimes the colors that we add in the, uh, you know, to color scenes with, you know, they're most of the times they're transparent. Okay. 
So it doesn't matter what media it is. Look at this. And those little leaves are fun. I need to work with those leaves more again. I want to do this scene too, again, um, without the, uh, the color up here. I do like the color up here because it really relates to this down here, but I thought those trees looked really good up there just with bear. And maybe put a couple of those little leaves down here. Some people got whole, um, um, leaf hole punches type of things. Um, and I want to see what people are doing with that in there. Because you can use that hole punch on any color of leaf um, that you want in there. But anyways, same types of processes like that. You know, so just... <clears throat> you know, if you can get kind of like um, kind of the base um, <clears throat> type of concept of... Um, these different techniques you can use it on just about any type of scene you want, okay? So on this one right here, again, it's just oscillating things. You know, the clouds up there are not all colored uniformly, like blue or something like that. It's just going from darker up here, lighter, a little bit darker, and lighter down here. But there's darks and lights in all of the little, you know, objects or areas of a scene. So just don't color in everything completely, and you can really... um you know, kind of direct lighting or define lighting in a scene. And that's all I'm doing um, just about with every card that I ever do. It's the exact same technique. <clears throat> and it might be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, different media, but I'm doing the same thing with colored pencils that I do with, uh, you know, dye-based inks or pigment inks or something like that. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll format these, uh, Patty, and I'll I'll show them in a uh, I'll do a little post or I'll do a I'll post a video or something like that and see what you, we'll see what these look like um, <clears throat> mounted and matted and uh, framed up there. Megan Ellis needs to get 100% cotton balls now. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I really tried with those synthetic ones because we had both of them. Um, but I just could never get the synthetic store. The synthetics feel softer and more billowier, but I just could not get it to um, <clears throat> accept enough of the white ink to transfer it. And then I was like dabbing forever and it's like not working at all. So, you know, and the 100% the cotton balls, um, <clears throat> as well as the 100% cotton, cotton swabs too, um, are the ones that work the best. And remember, um, when you ink up just to, you know, when you're inking, you know, up your, um, you know, where did my ink go? Remember when you're inking up to just kind of get a good slathering of it and then just kind of smash it down to flatten out that applicator and then dab off a little bit and then add it in there like that. <clears throat> uh, and like I said, everyone, um, when they first do it, they just, they're adding in way too much ink at, you know, any given time, so you know, kind of remove a little bit of it off, especially if you don't use your white pigment ink too much. And, uh, you know, the white pigment ink is going to be uh, like really thick on there. So just keep that in mind. I emphasize that a lot. <laughs> I know I say the same thing a gazillion times in all of my videos, but um, that's what I used to do on my workshops. Uh, they just hear me saying the same, you know, like, I don't know, like five things a hundred times. Yeah, the rays are fun, huh, Bonnie? It added a little bit of extra dimension in there. I, I like the look of it, though, too, just without them. But um, having not, you know, having such a, a limited range of values in here, especially like something like this, where it was just like a medium tone blue and kind of minimal use of it, and then a lot of lighter blues in here. Um, I just felt that it needed a little bit more... Um, range in there or I don't know some kind of dynamic application I don't find it like like super dynamic or anything like that it's you know it's just these light beams over a light surface like that but I think it added in kind of a nice touch to it it added a little bit of dimension too because it looks like these beams are kind of going off far in the distance like that okay so on the beams too you can see these like this see kind of like you can add it in the same kind of application from start to finish you know the beam and have it going right off the page if you want it really super dynamic but i like these kind of softer elements of it where it's like a more opaque beam and then kind of peter some of it all out and remember just take take a look and see what it looks like you know as you're doing it you know take a look and see what it looks like and if you want to add more you can always add more on there 
And you can even, one of the things I didn't do on here, because we wouldn't really be able to see it anyway, <clears throat> you can do a wide beam too and have it kind of lighter. <clears throat> and then you can have a narrow beam within that beam. So it looks like, you know, it's a layered beam. There's like one kind of closer to us in front of the lighter one in the background, you know, or the more see-through one, you know. And that's really fun to do as well. So the beams don't always have to be just side to side you can put one here and then put a narrow one right in the top of it but make it more opaque and that looks really cool too i do that sometimes when i'm doing it in uh like a darker scene like especially like through like a forested area where i use um i use a lot of like the tree trunk and tree trunk trio stamps and i really love uh the look of that you know crepuscular rays running through trees um, let's see. I made a sunbeam temple from a Stampin' Up! Sun with rays. It has a brad attaching the rays, so it's adjustable. Well, that sounds really cool, Linda. Uh, made it out of cardstock, but could also be made from acetate. Oh, that's interesting. Red lobster is in trouble. It's solution. All you can eat lobster. <laughs> I was watching this video on uh, this guy that goes around to buffets mostly, but he went into red lobster and it was like, is the all you can eat shrimp. Um, I think the title of it, their thumbnail was like, I don't know if they used scam was the word. I don't think they did, but um, I don't know, they walked out of, just the two of them walked out of, like, Red Lobster. I think he dropped, uh, with the all-you-can-eat um, shrimp um, deal, I think they walked out of there with, you know, they didn't buy alcohol, I don't think. It was just, like, regular, like, sodas or something like that. Um, but when all was said and done, it was like, I don't know, it was like $90 or something like that. I mean, his point was, you know, if you just order the shrimp, you know, kind of separately, you know, um would it, uh, you know, is the all you can eat, you know, aspect of it, you know, um, you know, a really great deal or something like that. Yeah, I want to try that triptych, uh, Caroline. I might have done that before, too. It would be interesting, too, to do those, like, beams of light like that. I used to do it sometimes, I think I did, on stamp board or clay board art tiles in this case. And then I would scribe lines back into, if anyone doesn't know, it's kind of like Scratchboard we're talking about. So if this was on Scratchboard right here, you can scratch in the lines back in there in these very engraved styles like that. And I had really kind of narrow ones and kind of wider ones. Not super wide, but um, they would actually be lines. So a beam like this might be, um, you know, created from like se like five you know scratch lines in it so it came you know it, it's basically like an engraving that you're doing but i think i've done that before i can't remember but it sounds kind of familiar um in terms of a triptych you know um featuring uh light beams like that so yeah i should do that right that Hey, so, so Hodgkins, you know, do you guys still have all of, you know, do you have a lot of the catalogs from different companies? So Hodgkins had he had a store, Penn Ventures, so I don't know. Do you guys have like, you know, unless you, I don't know, you probably, unless you kept them all, you, I don't know, do you have like 300 catalogs or something like that? Uh, maybe more, I don't know. Maybe 400, something like that. Oh yeah, cl oh close to my heart was uh, the dots then, right? Was that was that was in reference to? Yeah, that's right. Harold has been watching you doing the light beams. Yeah, hey, Harold, you got it. Okay, so is this Linda typing right here then? Yeah, Harold, you got to try out the light beams right there. Bust out that uh, bust out that brilliance white. Harold had a uh, Harold, you had a uh, idea card right that I used to get printed up. I have a secondhand PSX catalog. Close to my heart, okay. So Stampin' Up! was always Stampin' Up! then, right? Oh, you sold most of them. Oh, okay. 
I was thinking some of those catalogs, you know, going back, it'd be interesting. I'd like to get some catalogs and then, um, especially of those companies that, well, a lot of them aren't around anymore, but um, it's just kind of interesting to see. Be, I, like, like a big, a pretty big company used to be called um, um, Graphistamp. Okay. I used to see them all. You didn't see them in stores a lot of time. Well, you did. You saw them in stamp stores, but you also saw them in a lot of gift stores. Like I used to go to a lot of like uh, museums of natural history or something like that. And you would see their products in gift stores like that um, all the time because it was a lot of like, like sea mammals and things like that nature. And I was like, didn't have, um, couldn't find any information on them anywhere. And then, so I did that video, but I, I don't know, it was through some research, I was able to um, track down one of their um, owners um, of that line. And I think I have that, I have that um, catalog, but that's like one of those examples like that. It's just like, you know, a pretty big rubber stamp company um, at one point in time, and they just like no information of them anywhere, you know, and I really liked their um, designs. They were really cool. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> so it's like I'm asking right here. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, we don't have like a lot of, uh, you know, the, some of those catalogs from uh, back when. So um, I don't know. It'd be just kind of nice to uh, to have those um, documented somewhere. But like I said, I think I've gone through a lot of mine and I didn't have a lot of them to begin with, though, because I didn't like I said, I didn't go around and collecting them at those conventions, you know, that we were at because I was also demonstrating and things like that and I you know I I had my favorites of certain um companies um and I had some of their catalogs if they had a catalog some of them didn't have catalogs like um Stampa Barb had never had a catalog they would have had to have if they had a catalog they would have had to have like space for um I don't know I wouldn't be surprised if it was like a hundred thousand images or something like that maybe that's why he never did it you know and he didn't want to go mail order sometimes too because he thought felt that if he goes mail order then people wouldn't come over to the store anymore or something like that too. But they used to buy out just about I don't know if it was every company that went out of business, but a lot of companies that were um, closing up through like the early '90s, maybe mid '90s, or I don't know. I don't think it was late '90s. Maybe if some company was going out of business, they'd they'd offer it up to them because they probably had the cash flow for it or something like that. So they bought out um, a lot of different um, companies. Um, so yeah, they had, uh, you know, a gazillion lines, you know, under their um, entity. I don't know if they had, I, I think Stamp, Stamp Francisco or something like that might have bought them out. But then Stamp Francisco was purchased by, you know, someone else too. So they weren't uh, the original incarnation either. But Stamp Francisco bought out a lot of those companies that I liked. Um, like Gumbo Graphics, Stamp Francisco, and maybe a few of the other ones that had a lot of the old kind of 19th century engravings. So when I say they bought out those companies like that, and all the all the imagery was already copyright free anyways that they were using. So, um, but I guess they were buying maybe their their plates or anything like that, the molds and things like that. Um, or it's already kind of a curated line, maybe or I don't know. But um, but I wish I had some of the comp, um, stamp catalogs if they had them from places like. Um, Good stamp, stamp goods. Um, I think I have a Leavenworth Jackson here. I'm not sure. Um, Hunter Proof Press I have a catalog of, I think, and Gumbo Graphics. But there was a bunch of other ones, too, that were really cool. Hey, Carolyn, that'd be awesome. Yeah, if you can post them on uh, Facebook or something like that, or you can email them over. I was also posting some of those things up on... Um, um, Flickr. Maybe I'll open up a second Flickr account. <laughs> yeah. Because I have this um, Flickr gallery called, I think it's Rubber Stamp History. And um, I wasn't, I was mostly posting things that people had posted on Flickr already. And I just shared it to that um, Rubber Stamp History one. But um, yeah, it'd be great to have those up there, Caroline, if you can uh, post those or you can email them to me or you can post them on Facebook and 
Um, I don't know, kind of direct us over to that. Or maybe, maybe we should do something like this. Maybe I should start another group or something like that on Facebook and just call it like whatever. I don't know. Rubber stamp uh, history, I guess, or something like that. And uh, if anyone um, feels inclined, you know, just take some photos with your phone and, you know, uh, post the pictures up in um, a group like that. It'd be great to have some kind of like, you know, history of um, some of these places. Or if anyone went to conventions and took photographs, you know, at some point in time, a lot of people, times people have um, some photos of uh, conventions or something like that, and that would be really cool. It's cool to see um, different conventions around. A lot of times people just took, you know, photographs of samples or something like that too. But if you have photographs of um, uh, workshops or demonstrations like that, that would be really cool. I don't know, Harold, you know, yeah, I don't know, do you guys take some, uh, did you guys take photos, you know, in your uh, classes? If it's on film, that's kind of a hassle because you got to digitize it. But uh, I don't know, Harold, you, got, you guys, or Linda, you got to have uh, some uh, photographs of, you know, stuff there in the store, you know, that you might have done or have, you know, digital and, I don't know, convenient. Maybe you have to look it up somewhere, you know, and where that is, but that would be cool to, um, to get something like that uh, posted. Company that did Fre Freddy and Frita Frog. That sounds familiar, Harold. Yeah, 100 Proof, Pre 100 Proof Press is still out there too. So I think they're on their one, two, third owner, I think. I didn't know the first owner, but I knew, um, uh, what was her name? Uh, I forget her first name, but I think her last name was Money Penny because I was, I'm really bad at names, but I remember that one. Um, but I'd see them around at Cincinnati. I I like I really like that grouping of uh, um, designs from a hundred proof. That's one of those catalogs that and Gumbo Graphics where I can go through it. It's like, you know, I wouldn't mind having like seventy five percent of that entire catalog. You know, it was really awesome. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Let's let's start a let's start a uh, um uh, a group on Facebook like Rubber Stamp History or something like that. If there's not a group already called that, and we can post up at the, like that. I guess Facebook's hopefully Facebook's around to stay. You never know with these tech companies like that. Some of these things are like gigantic and it's like gone. You know, like I'm worried about Flickr sometimes. There was an angel company stamps. Uh, yeah, you're talking about that company that was called the angel company. I also know a company that was called the angel company, but he had amassed like all the different angels that he could find from other companies and he put it into one catalog. And, uh, but I, I think you're talking about the, the actual company that was called that though, all right? The Freddy and Frida Frog sound familiar. Maybe I'm just kind of imagining it, though. But I knew this. Um, I used to teach at this store called Toad Hall. So she had, like, a wall of, you know, like, frog, I think, you know. I think she collected a lot of it, so she ordered a lot of those ones there. Um, but it was a rubber stamp store called Toad Hall. The owner loved, you know, loved frogs. Uh, rubber baby, yeah, the rubber pit. <laughs> now, no one has a photograph of that, though. Do you have a photograph of that, Catherine? You know, when people are going to those conventions, I mean, it's awesome. You know, there were cameras around, but um, like when they were around, that was still like probably film mostly. I don't know if people had picked up, you know, digital cameras. Digital cameras were probably around, but it even took me like, I love taking photos, but it took me a few years to uh, pick up a digital camera. And even so, like storage of digital photos and stuff like that, you know, like hard drive space was expensive. So, but it'd be really cool if we had some photos, you know, of that rubber pit, you know, that rubber pit was, that was a big feature of those, uh, that convention, you know, it was one of those, it was kind of the, one of those run to the booth types of um, um, features at those different conventions that were out there. What was it? It was Chuck and Paula, right? For Rubber Baby? We still have the photos somewhere hoarded away. Okay, so those are the hard copy photos, Harold. You don't have anything on Dig, you know, like from the 2000s or something like that. 
the artist demonstrator stamps, she had stamp art on packages, but not the name. Uh, okay. Huh. If you have a photograph, so... Yeah, okay, so... <coughs> so, yeah, if you have those... Uh, so Here, I wouldn't even think about this. So, if people have hard copy photos, you can just take a digital photo of the print, you know, too. Or even if you just kind of put out, you know, like, a bunch of photos. You know, you don't have to do it one by one and crop them and, you know, clean them up or anything like that. But if you just have, like, photos, just, you know, and you don't want to take a lot of time, just put, you know, several photos online and just take a picture of, like, a grouping of it and just post it up like that. I'd love, I'd love to see some of these um, things like this, you know. Some of these things, you know, once these companies were gone, it's like, like I said, there's no record of it anywhere, you know. Um, or those, you know, some conventions that were around, or booths, like we're talking about. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of it because I was always working the shows. So one time, I have, like, photographs of the Carson convention because um, my boss said, Hey, Kevin, you know, maybe you can take some photos at this next show. So I walked around and I specifically took some photos, like, um, I don't know, like for 15 minutes or a half an hour or something like that. But... Um, um, yeah, uh, some of those, um, entity, entities were really quite something, like the lines to get into, the, like, the Carson show sometimes. I don't think I got a photograph of that, but there might be, I don't know, 300, 400 people out there in line sometimes before the show opened on Saturday mornings, and getting there when we got there as a company to set up our booth, you know, or finish setting up, like, two hours before the show was opened, and there'd be like a line, you know, and there was two entrances at that show too. So I wish some people had some photographs of uh, things like that, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean? It'd be like us, you know, that went to those things, you know, but it'd be just kind of cool to be able to see some of those things again. Oh, it's a Scottish Rite Temple here in Sacramento. Okay. Yeah. I went to that show once, uh, Christine, the Sacramento show. And it was when it was, well, it was always Rubberama, right? But it was the first one that Donnie put on. And I don't know if it was at that Scottish Rite temple. Um, but uh, yeah, that'd be cool uh, to see some of those um, uh, show photos, like I said. Um, I have some of it up on my Flickr gallery already. That, like, But it's mostly of like my booth, you know. I, didn't, I don't have like photographs of like <clears throat> all around the show and things like that. Again, yeah. Amir was a really big help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember people bringing those, like, little compact mirrors, you know. And especially, I think they were especially getting... It was for the word stamps, right? Word and quote stamps. They can see it in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, like, funny. Um, so that rubber pit like that. And then um, it's that company that still goes around to the shows, but the sister sold it to the brother and he was at the mesa convention the last one i went to um god what was it rubberneckers rubberneckers i remember seeing all that rubber in the rubbernecker booth and people with their mirrors you know little compact mirrors or something like that for the uh for the, all that unmounted rubber in those um places we have 50 years of harold's photos buried upstairs yeah it might take you 50 years to go through them. But, yeah, that'd be cool. Harold, that's your um, that's your project uh, for this next week here. Go and organize all those photos. Take a digital photograph of those and then post those to the uh, rubber stamp history. I don't know, anyone can, if any of you can, you know, I don't have to, you know, anyone can start a group on Facebook. And just uh, I don't know. Just let us know if it's uh, if it's up, <laughs> or just make it. A, I think if you make it up, just a public group though too. You don't have to make it a private group, right? And then anyone can just go on there and post away. You don't have to, you know, um, uh, you know, accept invitations to it or anything like that. I I think right. I, I think that I started one group for my old um, illustration professor. It was like. Long Beach State Illustration Alumni or something like that. And I think, I seem to recall it was easy to do. And I just made a public group, I think. And I think I'm the only member in it. 
but it was easy to do, but it would be just cool to have like, you know, some documented stuff, like I said. So uh, that's Harold's. Harold's going to be a big contributor to that one, you know, so 50 years of Harold's photos up there. But it's not 50 years. That wouldn't be 50 years of stamping stuff, though, uh, Linda. We want the stamping related stuff, you know, photographs of your store and workshops and things like that. And uh, Harold's going to do that. He's going to organize it. Um, you know, in terms of uh, time and uh, theme. <laughs> Reverend Ecker last year, yeah. Okay, okay, he went to the Sacramento Scrapbook. That's, that rubber necker, um, if anyone's never been to a convention before, there's some booths that are, you know, really small, just a few things out, something like that. But that rubber necker booth, it must have been, when I saw him at Mesa, I don't think I saw him, I don't know if I saw him there before, or, you know, since I've been doing shows there. I'm not doing the next show, but um, that booth must have been... 40 feet long or something like that with rolling kind of display units and stuff like that. It was, it was like really something. So I was thinking, man, he, that guy must be going around, you know, to all of the different shows and just traveling from show to show these days, you know, to have that, you know, amount of, uh, you know, setup um, out there. And it was big and they just go around in this big truck and, you know, uh, roll it up in there. It was huge. Yeah, it's just like um, Stamps by Judith. You know, they do that too. But I think this guy's booth was like bigger than uh, Stamps by Judith too. All right, folks. I'll get these formatted up. So all of these right here are going to get spray sealed with... Um, I'm going to do it with the Krylon workable fixative. And uh, I don't think... So these ones right here... Sometimes I've mentioned when I've used some types of inks on these, if I go really dark with them, sometimes they dry dull. But because these ones aren't going really, I didn't saturate the uh, surfaces. I think what you see is what you get in here. So sometimes when I go really thick with a lot of layered inks on some of my pieces, I haven't been doing that a lot lately though, but, and then I put the beams over the top of it. The beams kind of, they get, they darken. Okay, but as I sit here and, you know, kind of, uh, shoot the breeze with all of you. Um, I've noticed that looking down on this, that beam did, didn't change. So I think it's just going to remain like that. Okay. But when I spray seal this, I'm going to spray seal it with the workable fixative. I've been spraying it with thicker styles of sprays over the years, like the UV resistant clear and everything like that. But I think the, uh, the workable fixative is going to retain the look of that. Sometimes if you spray these beams right here that are a little bit more delicate like that, too thickly with the, uh, you know, with too thick of an application of acrylic um, sprays like that, clear sprays, it disappears a little bit. Not completely if you hit it lightly, but if you really slather it, the beams would tend to disappear. But the workable fixatives are, it's a really thin acrylic sealant and it dries really fast on there. So I think it, I think these pieces are just going to remain like that. So here's, again, you know, it's a good, just a little bit of recap here too, and that little bit of color like that. So you can bend your color schemes around a little bit just with some really light tones, you know, to get some different looks on there. This one right here, I don't see too much of this antique linen. I think the antique linen was more apparent earlier, but I think it's dried and it's kind of like dulled out a little bit, but you can see it's a little bit, I mean, there's a little bit of a tinge of warmth here, like that little glow in there. I think it's the antique linen over some of that blue. I'm not sure. Maybe a little bit. I'm not, but um, you can tweak your pieces just by doing some light applications like that. So anyway, just made the batteries about to die. <laughs> Hope you get your power back on there, Linda. All right, everyone. I thought I misspelled something there for a second there. All right. So I hope you see on that. And if you anyone's on Facebook, um, I don't know. Sometime over this weekend, I'll do a, uh, I'll do a uh, a group, a new group, or something like that. Uh, the uh, uh, rubber stamp, rubber stamp history, or something like that. I don't know, that doesn't sound like that's not an appealing name like that. 
I don't know. If, if anyone else, you know, can think of, you know, a better name for it or something like that, then, you know, you can start the group too. And just, uh, like I said, leave it at maybe like a public group and we'll just, uh, you know, as time goes by or something like that, we'll post some uh, photos of uh, things like that up in uh, photos and things like that or photographs of uh, catalog covers would even be cool, you know, or something like that. All right, everyone. Thanks again.